a lot of it just comes down to overall money and financing and what are people willing to to pay to come out all the time right. um and you know we we set our tickets at a very reasonable price super reasonable 15 dollars a ticket you know right. with discounts given uh, and it's BYOB, so and it's not super like you're liberal with the discounts given Correct. part of the very ticket. liberal. I'm the worst business owner uh, ever, ever in the entire history of business owners, uh, because everyone could just be like, "Hey, can I come in?" I'll be like, "Sure, whatever." Like, hey, I had a rough in. week this week. God, I didn't exactly. get paid yet. You're like, it's, get, you know, get at, your the, ass at the end here. of the day. We're always collaborating at all times with the universe. Dude, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm really glad that you're here. I'm excited to like chop shop with you and get into some stuff. Yeah. I mean, I realize I don't know anything about you. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, in hindsight, right? Right. Like, well, So Jason, oh, my first mm-hmm. guest for my podcast, he did uh, your comedy writing class. Correct. And he is just one of those people that's just like kind of creatively the person who uh, he instigates a lot with me and... Uh, he kind of pushes me to do some things that maybe I wouldn't normally do. Yeah. And he knows that like one of my passions is stand up. So he was like, dude, I think you should do it. Like I did it. It was a really rewarding experience. He's like, I'll let you know how it goes. And then if you want to, I'll take it with you in the summer. And I think we did it last summer together. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and it was a great experience. Cause for me, I think the last barrier to entry to getting into stand up was the, you know, core foundational pillar of joke writing. And so, you know, you see comedy and I'm sure that this is, there's a litany of people that do this, but they're like, I could do that. <laughs> and then you see how easy it is to eat shit on stage and not have the ability to perform. Oh, yeah. perform I mean, it all. A- anybody can do it. it. Anyone can do most things. Right. Just not well. Right. Exactly. <laughs> or poorly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At best poorly. Um, and actually what's funny is the last show that I went to wasn't the previous one, but the one before it, uh, there were a couple of friends of mine that were, uh, doing, they had taken the class and they were doing their showcase. And, uh, we went and I heard through the grapevine that some of the people that I went there to see were like, dude, it's official. We're comedians now. (laughs) And I was like, I don't know that that's exactly how that works. I feel like it's more of like a, yes, you've done it. Now it's like a, you got to keep doing it kind of situation. Um, but yeah, so Jason got me in and I, I was like, you know what? Like I have been in a period of my life the last like five years or so where it's really been like a challenge myself and and see where I can rise to the occasion and do what I say I'm going to do. And comedy was definitely something that, I mean, being on stage, I'm not unfamiliar with whatsoever, holding a microphone specifically, not something I'm unfamiliar with. So it was like, okay. And I, I joke and fuck around on stage all the time. Like, I think that's got to be a part of your, um, uh, persona because otherwise if you're trying to be like the mystery band where you're just on stage and it's just music and then interludes in between the tracks and you just say the same like five things that other bands say between like make sure you check out merch and we're really happy to be here in cleveland this is the best show of the whole tour like that kind of stuff is just like it's like cannon fodder basically yeah so uh i've resorted to just like observing and making jokes about things that are going on whether it's security in the front or whatever it is and uh, yeah, so I was like, you know what, my last barrier to entry to this is learning how to write. And so I finally took that class and, uh, you know, I think like people could, might look at the idea of taking a comedy class as sort of like a, oh, if you have to take a class, like, can you really, are you really good at it? But to me, I looked at it like, if you are serious about anything, you should kind of be filling in the foundational areas of all the things that you want to do. And that comes, I mean, I'm constantly, you can ask Carlos, my intern, like we were sitting here for like a half an hour, just tweaking and adjusting and talking about like things that we want to do for the podcast to help uh, promote and grow it. And comedy writing was that thing that I needed to do. I was like, I need to learn how to do this. Like I'm terrible at letting myself implement structure where I should. And that's like the thing that you need with joke writing because otherwise you're just kind of like aimlessly shooting in the dark and hoping you land on something. Yeah. No. um, I remember Jason telling me, I got some friends that I'm going to get to take this. And everyone always says that. Right, right, right. I never believe them until, you know, until, <laughs> until someone, until someone types in their credit card information into right, the website. Right. I don't believe that anyone else is, that's, is coming. That's how I know you're serious. Um, yeah. But it was, uh, but yeah, that class was, that was a great time. You know, I, and I probably said this during that class when it comes to stand up comedy, I don't necessarily think there's, I don't believe I'm a teacher per se. I'm a facilitator of a, creative space where people can try things, fail things and learn and collaborate. 
uh, because I don't believe there's a scientific way of here are the number of beats that you need to hit in this way and that way because there's so many different ways that you can you can do comedy. Um, so it's not as scientific as as even music, which isn't that scientific, but still like the scientific behind it. Yeah, but the really popular adage for even songwriting is that there's no right way right. to write a song. Yeah. And, I, and I feel like that's a creative thing more than mm -hmm. it's like a songwriting specific thing. There's really no right way to create art. It's just whether or not right. your art is adopted and accepted by more people or not. And what your intentions are and your goals and what you're, you know, what you define as what's going to be successful for the thing that you're creating. Yeah. And, uh, and the good thing, you know, the thing with, you know, a lot of us grow up grow up with music and so understand verbiage what is a chorus you know right what is a note everything like that but with comedy um you know because i listened to a couple of the other podcasts we were talking about this with with both jasons actually <laughs> you know like what does it mean to have a punchline versus a setup what is a premise versus an actual joke what is adding a tag versus a callback like all these kind of terms of like oh that's what john mulaney is doing or oh that's right. what mitch hedberg's doing i think the writing and performing stand-up comedy class helps with that. And then you figure out where you want to go with it. So. Well, so I wanted to dive into that a little bit because I feel like part of what you're doing also in the area is not just like teaching these classes, but really you're kind of fostering the culture. And this is yeah. like my biggest gripe with State College is that it's more, you know, Happy Valley severely lacks in that realm of, you know, facilitating outside of what are, I guess, like the handful of, you know, socially accepted arts that, you know, the borough wants to promote and push through Arts Fest or things. Like, there's no reason to me that there couldn't be, you know, a comedy set downtown during Arts Fest. And, there, yeah. and by all means, there totally should be. Mm -hmm. We have artists and stuff like that already. So, like, why not to break up that beat a little bit, have some evening comedy and and just you know promote that culture a little bit or even improv it's a stage like yeah. if there's no instruments on there now you've got a stage with which to be able to do that now maybe that's a matter of how do you mic everybody or or whatever but that even that's doable you know yeah. with the right they contract out to the right people to get live sound and event production put on right there on Allen Street. There's no reason why they couldn't also go the extra distance of having somebody that they hire to come out <laughs> and lav mic everybody oh. up and you know as long as the cast is currently no greater than six because that's what i've got the capacity to do and we could totally do that you have like a half an hour you know improv set and then some comedy and then some whatever yeah uh so we do have sh four shows during arts fest uh at okay. the bluebrick theater so but it's, we at have, theater. it's at our, that's our theater uh i will say that uh if we were to offer if we were offered to do comedy to do improv outside we would turn it down uh, in fact we just had a festival this past weekend uh, and we had this long conversation in Baltimore. They're starting to do like one group is doing some improv outside. And like four of us were like, I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. And the reason is for improv or even stand up or anything to for that art form to be consumed, you have to be paying attention. Yeah. Because if you miss something, you can't you're not going to understand like the next thing or the next thing or the next thing. A lot of things tie together. So when you're outside and people are walking by and just be like, oh, I'm just going to watch this for a little bit. Do I like it or not? Or they, you know, the bird flies by and you like look and then you come back and you missed, you know, you missed a setup. It really makes it seem like it's not as good of a customer experience, really what it is. Uh, so we get asked all the time to do uh, like to go, you know, Friedman Park or to be in MLK Plaza. And we've done a few of those shows. And the experience is just not even close. And that, you know, and then for me as a business owner, okay, what type of, what type of brand? And I say this all the, all the time. It's so different from music because it's not as widely accepted as an art and creative expression and even just entertainment. If I go into, let's say I go into a bar in Williamsport or something and there's a band playing. Uh, or an individual singer songwriter, and they're not the greatest, right? I'll leave that situation and probably say that band. I wasn't feeling that band. Right. I don't leave that situation and say, "Man, music's not for me." <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But a lot of people have never gone to a live improv show. Right. And so if they go and they see improv for the first time, and they see it's not the greatest, they'll probably leave that situation saying, "Improv's not for me." Right. So they'll capture every single thing, which is something we talk a lot about with, you know, my partners from around the country that are trying to grow improv and growing the theater space is 
you know, you need to put a really good product on your stage because you never know who's coming to your show. Oh, for so sure. So if you put the best product up and they come out of it and they say, wow, improv is a lot cooler than what I thought it was, especially what we do, which is long form improv. So it's not the whose line is it anyway or stuff that you see on TV. Right, right, right. You know, you need to kind of educate the audience that this is what it is and it's good. But there's a lot, a lot of bad improv <laughs> yeah, 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 in the certainly. world. Uh, so, so yeah, so I, I do, but I, but with that, I understand what you're what you're saying. Like there needs to be more of the culture. That's what we're building. You know, seven years ago there wasn't a, there wasn't any comedy in town besides right. Wisecrackers. Wisecrackers on New Year's Eve. Year. Yeah, 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 for sure. You know, um, there used to be. I you know I just moved here nine years ago, so but I guess there was twenty some odd years ago a comedy club where they had more frequent things, kind of like a funny bone. It wasn't called a funny bone or something. Down where. Like P Man's is now. That used to be G Man's, and like before that, there was some comedy. I don't know. I've heard yeah. some stories back in the day, uh, but when I got here, you know, there was nothing. You know, there I wanted to do improv. There was no adult improv in State College, which makes no sense for a town of fifty plus thousand individuals plus fifty thousand plus students. Yeah, I mean, especially when you think about the fact that like these students are basically a revolving door every four mm -hmm. years. You've got a new roster, and really yeah. every year, depending on when you actually get a hold of a, a, right. a group of people or catch their attention, are you really able to kind of integrate them into the system? But I, my big argument has been, you know, we are in the social media TikTok realm of things, and there are so many people that are hilarious on TikTok mm -hmm. that are just doing like their own little thing, their own little shtick. And these people are also people that are in college. Like I've met kids here that unassumingly have like, you know, one and a half million followers on TikTok. And I'm like, these people are here now and we have no space for them to be able to go and continue to grow and evolve their expression. And if they could, that would kind of be able to help push State College as one of these places, it's kind of becoming its own version of a mini Nashville. And uh, so I did want to get into it a little bit. Like you, so the Blue Brick Theater started, you guys are officially open, what, two years now, right? Yep, just about two years. So two years come July. So you just did the second annual uh, XL Fest. Correct. And then you had like people from all over the country, all um, over the world. All over the world, yeah. <laughs> that's we, a really amazing. Technically, we're international because we had one person from Montreal. So. <laughs> exactly. That's That constitutes that international. That constitutes as an is international Is that not festival. a border? I feel like it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... And I, I came down to help out with that because you, yes. you approached me, was it last week? Yeah, we actually sat like down and talked. Two hours beforehand, basically. We, we kind of like, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Might as well then for all intents yeah. and purposes. Uh, but when you were walking me through, you're like, yeah, like uh, I have these two people. They're going to come in. They're going to be doing this podcast. They're from L.A. They, we want to do a live podcast. I initially had heard live and I thought live streaming, mm. which I have the capability of doing is not, not a problem. But you were like, no, no, no. This is just going to be like live to tape. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, we can definitely do that and happy to do it because, I mean, to me, I think part of fostering the culture is not just what I can invest monetarily, but what I can invest in my time. And I looked at it like you are somebody who I value you in the same way I value – like there's a handful of people in this area that do promotion for shows, for booking you know, musical acts and yeah. talent in that regard. And I mean, people don't understand that in a social economy of art and creativity, these people are – fundamentally necessary to have in your, you know, zeitgeist of yeah. ability to create and, and do that kind of stuff. And, and so I support, you know, people, I know people in the area that are promoters that are maybe not socially very acclimated well to being able to read a situation and tell when they're being a little off kilter or whatever, but they are still fundamentally really good at what they do when it comes to getting into a venue, setting up a show, getting bands to come in from out of town, getting them to play, getting them paid. So they want to keep doing it. And, to me, I'm like, you know what? If he's a little weird or she's a little weird, like it is what it is. They're doing this like crucial social service that is like necessary to kind of foster any sort of culture. And I, I count you in the group of people that are, I think, fundamentally necessary in this area to kind of do that because, you know, without it, it doesn't exist. Like if you don't foster it, it can't exist. And I feel bad for the 10 and 12 year old, 13, 14 year old kids that don't have the reason to get together with a bunch of their friends that also kind of play an instrument and just fucking suck in a garage so that they can like figure out what music means to them and whether or not they want to pursue it and what they want to do because there's nowhere for them to scale up to to play in their own hometown. Yeah. So they can't, you know, you, if you can't do it here, if you can't do it where you're from, 
it's really hard to kind of get out of town an hour and a half, two hours, three hours, go to Cleveland, go to Pittsburgh, go to Philly, go to, you know, upstate New York and play a show somewhere where you've got no experience doing it. And now you've got to navigate the the thralls of traveling with a band and being in a van with a trailer and driving out of state or away to do it. And you can't hone your craft really because you're not practicing really and you're not – it's just not starting. Yeah. It's like this like non-starter. And, and I feel really bad because I feel like I got that luxury even when I, even though I was terrible. I had a friend whose basement we went and we practiced in. You, it's like necessary. And you're doing that through Blue Brick Theater. Um, what have been some of the obstacles you guys have run into in the first like year or two of being in operation? You guys are in a building lease for five years. You're in two, two uh, out of the five years right now? Yeah, we have, we have a three-year with a five-year extension available to us. So. Okay. Uh, so we'll be there for a little while, you know, it's, it's a perfect size, man. Like it's, it's it, for what you guys are doing there. I think that is like a fun, I would make that like the flagship location, oh, yeah, the place sure. that you like have to go. And that's like the, you know, the training wheels protocol for like growing and developing and it functions well as the actual stage place as well. So like you can't get any better than that in one location, but I would love to see you guys on a place where you actually had like more of a theater style set up with like a raised stage and, you yeah. know, 200, 250 cap venue that could pack out to that regard or even half pack and still feel full. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, long run, love to have a space that has a bigger stage with a backstage. We'd love to seat one to 150, 200 people, be able to convert that with tables for a more stand up venue rather than theater style seating. Uh, but, you know, that that type of space is going to be very expensive if we want to stick around downtown right. State College. Well, especially in downtown State uh, College, right? Exactly. The real estate here, not friendly to anybody in a small business capacity. Right. So so there, so there's that. Um, and, you know, and is it is it viable in a Belfont or is it viable yeah. outside the, you know, you know, maybe – I, I talk with the with the guy who runs Wisecrackers. You know, if the casino at the mall comes, will they op- will they open up a you know a Wisecrackers like entertainment type stand up thing at the at the casino? You know, I don't yeah. know, maybe. Uh, but to answer your question about what type of of hurdles we've had, you know, it hasn't been that it hasn't been awful with stuff. The the biggest hurdle was just getting people to know about us, right? Trying to budget through how much should we be advertising. Uh, what should we, you know, when should we do shows? We, right now we just do one show a week. Everything else is like classes. Uh, how do we educate and grow the community around us to know what improv is and what we do, um, without growing too fast? Because we're very much want to make sure that we're very intentional on where we're going, how fast we're moving. Could we do shows every single night of the week at 11 p.m. and just like blast the campus, like come see some comedy? Probably. But is that really what we want? Like but right. we want to kind of just like foster this, you know, higher brow comedy, not punching down. How can we be supportive? How can we be accepting? How can we kind of build this whole brand out? So, you know, it hasn't – there haven't been a lot of hurdles per se, you know – this Pennsylvania liquor and control board and having <laughs> the inability to get any sort of liquor license in state college is just like hurts us because we could, you right. know, and every, every Friday night we take a big group of 20 people to a different bar. Like all that could be revenue that's back into the theater. Right into the theater. That could be putting back in. Um, and we've partnered, we've partnered with, uh, with places like, like Pickles and Cafe and The Graduate and The Hyatt where they would kind of sponsor our tickets. So like we can keep some of the money back in uh, with the collab part. Right, right, right. Uh, but like that would be the, that'd be the biggest thing I would change. Like if I could get, gosh, even if it was just like a beer and wine. It'd be so much better. Yeah. So uh, anti-fragile downtown, one of the mm-hmm. ways that they kind of mitigated it <laughs> was by being a brewery. Right. So they're like, unless you want to find some master brewer and get them in here <laughs> right. and invest in that setup so you could actually disturb yeah. whatever it is you're doing there. Yeah. Um, and then I know that there's, uh, depending on how you guys are structured as a company, there's the ability to do like one-offs up to like six times a year or something yeah. like that for like larger events where mm-hmm. you could do uh, like event-oriented permits of selling alcohol. Right. So we could get a we could get like a brewery to use one of their tokens to come in and set up uh you know maybe like big spring or or antifragile or whatever axman uh, brewery axman anything Voodoo. like that and so we could do that and we had thought of doing that possibly for like the festival right something, right, right something for something, something for big. the festival big um and even or even doing you know maybe shutting down part of calder way during the festival and having like a, a beer tent outside set up by one of them 
Uh, I know uh, Cigar Den, when they do their Havana Fest, they do something very similar where they have MLK Plaza shut down and they'll bring in, uh, I think they always bring in Axman or, 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 or Big Spring. And so I've the, seen Pisano Winery. I've correct, seen also come in there. All, yeah. all that type of stuff. So those are those are things that we might grow for next year for, for the festival. Uh, we've we've you know we're we're right up against Cafe. Right. And so I don't know if there's any connection somehow between the buildings, and I don't know if there's a share type thing. Or, yeah, or I wouldn't be surprised to see that there might be something you know, like that. So we, we've we've thought through it. I mean, right now we're just BYOB and right. you know just taking it taking it one step at a time. Um, but yeah, it's been a ride, man. It's been a ride. I could totally see. Uh, Cafe 210 be in a really good spot to actually do improv and stand up. Oh, like if yeah. they did a night where they did that and be like, hey, it's hard to get them to want to split <laughs> any percentage right. of the alcohol sales. They're like, ah, that's real cute. Yeah. Well, you're just playing the stage, sir. You're yeah. good. Thank you. But if you could generate that into at least a guarantee to come in and do it, like, mm-hmm. a, you know, a band does, at least then it could be a, hey, maybe we're not getting Fridays and Saturdays, but Thursday is a pregame to ramp up into the weekend, like get everybody's kind of mood right and yeah. get them laughing and having a good time. You could, I could easily see, you know, that being a good spot for Santa, at least stage wise, it kind of fits a demographic Absolutely. and then crowd wise, it's kind of like a, a really good, uh, it's not necessarily low ceilings, but it is kind of like a tight and width kind of room. Yeah. It's, it would be, we've thought of doing open mics there. Yeah. So great, we don't, man. we've only done a couple of open mics at the theater and the main reason is locations make money off of the bar for open mics. Right. Because sure. usually you're not charging audience members to come watch people fail and try out their most recent dick jokes. Right, 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 right. right. You know? uh, and I have a really tough time charging people for stage time. I think that's anti our mission at the theater. Of yeah, being like, pay to hey, play. Right, I don't want to pay to play. So what does that mean? Like I give my time, energy, electricity, toilet paper, all that stuff I to mean, open the theater to how much do. you got to pay somebody to come up and do a five-minute set testing out their new dick jokes? Yeah, like, exactly. 15 minutes. Yeah, right. And that's the other thing is getting around, you know, getting people that can actually come up and show up and play it and mm-hmm. do like a 15-minute set. Oh, yeah. It, most of my, you know, it's, it's five minutes or whatnot. But a place like, you know, a place like Cafe would be a good, or, or, or Pickles or, or any of these places. Zeno, I talked to Zeno's a little bit. You know, a few months ago, like, would that be a good spot to to do yeah, some comedy? Yeah, low ceiling. I, I, know? I absolutely mess with low ceiling, not yeah. that wide of a room. Like, everybody's kind of densely packed. That's yeah. a, That, to me, is a good situation because it feels vulnerable. It's kind of like at an acoustic yeah. set versus playing in full band. Like, you're a little bit more stripped down, so there there is allowed to be this sort of, like, uh, intimacy between, you know, performer and crowd. Yeah. I could definitely see that being the case. Um, so, I just, need, I just need someone that's willing to to do that weekly or monthly and host the host the stuff and then get the good relationship with the bar or the venue that will, I don't know, give you a few hundred bucks for your time, but you know that you're going to bring in 50, 60 people to hang out. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's so interesting. Have you ever been to the comedy store in LA? Mm-hmm. So like kind of their setup is very similar where like basically the comedians are the people that run that place. Like they're the ones that are operating the door. They're the ones that are running the bar. They're, you know, like everybody that's there is also kind of like Ch- you know, cutting their teeth and, and using that as a means of developing. So I feel like that is almost fundamentally baked into the model of you want to be able to have a place where people can kind of come in and get a drink and you can make a little bit of revenue off of that. There's maybe a door cover. And then, uh, I, you know, so I guess like the only intermediary option that you have is to kind of partner with one of these places that is, yeah. is looking for that kind of entertainment. And at least if you could get it consistent, it's like, you know, I look at uh, like the first, I think most of the bands only have to play like a three hour set. Yeah. So having a pool of comedians that could come down and be doing their open mics and having the open mic opportunity to sign up. Like if you're not a previous one, you get, you know, you get your, I don't know if you get five minutes, you get like three minutes, two minutes, yeah. whatever the, the breakdown ends up being. But I'm very interested in facilitating seeing this grow. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the podcast, because I feel like it's a uh, at some point um, it can't always just be about the exposure you're getting. It's also about just sort of like footprint and available availability to see what's going on in this area and have it be articulated in a way where people can be like, oh, that's the problem. Because like there's got to be some rich old white dude in this area who's like, hey. I've got a little bit of money and I'd like to see some comedy with my wife. Yeah. Like, you know, here's, I'm going to just going to scoop down and like help you guys out. Oh, sure. And, and you know, the, the money's part of it, but at the end of the day, it also is, it's also time. And I've told people, I've told everyone in my classes, probably told your class as well for stand up. I'm like, if you all want more open mics, like there's an easy solution. Just go to every bar downtown and say, Hey, I'd like to produce an open mic here. Yeah. And fine. And like, and go do it. Um, you know, 
especially during the school year when I'm doing tutoring because I left Penn State. So now I'm fully just my own boss, which is awesome. How does that feel? It's awesome. It's just a lot of work. You right, know? right, like, right. Normally, if I'm it's looking- It's all on you. <laughs> if I'm looking at a normal week, right? A normal week, I'm probably teaching stand-up on a Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm doing pickles trivia on a Wednesday. I have improv practice on Thursday. We have improv shows on Friday. I'm usually doing some sort of stand-up show or something on Saturday. And Sunday, we have our- like improv practice group that's at the theater and I do writer's group on Sunday. Yeah. So I, I've started to utilize the writer's <laughs> group again. I came last week. Yeah. Um, after we had our meeting, you're like, you should go. Yeah, it was nice. Sunday that we met up we actually. Met, yeah. You're like, yeah, you're like, you should come. We're doing one today. And I was like, you know what? I keep saying I'm going to, I definitely, that's I want fun. to, and I'm, I'm like constantly writing shit in my phone, yeah. but and actually, as I've been traveling now, that's what I've been doing is oh, yeah. hitting up, looking for open mics in the area, like in Atlanta and down in Nashville. Um, what is it? Zanies, I think, has like a yeah. like an open mic night uh, when it's in Florida for vacation. Like I'm always just trying to find places while I'm out there to just be like, go and dip my feet, get oh yeah, just get you know, take the leap and try to get out there. And like, I don't mind eating shit. I think it's actually there's some comedy in that too, right? Like when you go up there and you 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 know you're eating shit. It's like all right, now the recovery kind of becomes like let's all laugh this off together because right. this is fucking terrible. Yeah, and almost every big city is gonna have a Facebook group that's like state college like we have a state college improv group there isn't a, a full comedy group because there's not big of comedy scene but i'm in most large city comedy scene facebook groups so that way if i'm traveling and i know like oh i'm gonna be in portland like i'll be in portland next week i'll probably try and find an open mic to hit up yeah. just to have fun yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, just stretching your legs man yeah um do you integrate at all with any of the clubs on campus? Are there any like campus yeah. improv classes? So or? there are. So there are two really decent improv slash sketch groups on campus and one stand up group. So full ammo improv is a long form improv. But like you already kind of commented on this, you know, by the time someone steps into leadership, they're probably third year. Right. And then they've got a year and they're gone. Right. So we've had a very tough time cultivating a relationship with them. Uh, we sponsor their festival every year. We are one of the sponsors of their festival every year because we want to continue to grow that relationship. But it's been really hard for us to reach out and like get meetings and say, hey, how can we help you? Like, how can we help you raise money? How can we give you more stage time? Because we really want to. Right. Uh, we are, have, a, have had a little more luck with Derby. So Derby is the all women or non-binary comedy group. They do sketch, improv, and stand up all in one group. Uh, they have shared our stage a few times during some of our festivals, and they've come on come on down. Uh, then they have this thing called Second Floor Stand Up, which every other I think it's every other Tuesday uh, in the Willard Building they do like open mics. Okay. Um, but they a couple of years ago, right before COVID, they closed it to the community. It's just students, which like uh. kind of understand, but you know, so it's hard to hard to get any stage. It's 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 impossible to get stage time in this town for like for stand up. Uh, Three Dots has an open mic, but it's music, poetry. It's hard to go up there and say, hey, I'm going to talk about my dog and, you know, their butthole. Like <laughs> right, no, right, right. no one's wanting to listen to it. I've done some sets there. I posted some of those on TikTok and, and Instagram and they've, they've, they've done fairly well. Um, but I've been, you know, I've been doing stand up since, since 2008 ish, 2006 ish. So like <laughs> a ripe 15, I've, 17 I've, year I've, I've, window. I mean, of not, time not developed. you know, I'm not consistently not like in front of large crowds all the time. Well, it's hard because that's not here. Correct. But at the same time, like I have a solid, I have a solid 20 minutes that if like someone called me today and was like, Hey, tomorrow night, we need someone to do 20 minutes on stage. I'll hold my own. I'm not going to kill, but I'm not going to bomb. Right, right, right. So I know the if I go to an, if I go to an open mic that's outside at three dots on the patio and I have to go after JVJ doing some amazing poetry, I have the ability to read a room and be able to at least not completely bomb. Right, right, right. But if I have a student who's never stepped on stage before, like, and that's the only place I can send them to get extra practice. You're feeding them to the wolves. <laughs> Correct. Like, that's why we started the writer's group on Sundays. Right. You know, it's not an open mic per se, but it's an open mic. Like, you can go up and you can practice. You can write. You can get feedback. Right. Uh, so we've thought of, you know, are there other ways to do that? So, like, last month we did these, – these two individuals were coming through doing, like, a mini tour – uh, and they just reached out to us like, Hey, Blue Brick Theater, can we do a show? And I was like, sure, why not? So a couple Saturdays ago, they did a show. And what I did was took five of our 
comedians who are five of our students who have done at least two of the classes, if not three, uh, that I thought were ready. And I put them as the feature artists. Yeah. So they each did five minutes up front. Then we took an intermission. Then we did the two people that were traveling through. Gotcha. Um, and that did well. That's a great we setup. The, right. Because that gives them some time. Um, you know, we were able to sell more tickets. We were able to give more money to, you know, what paid each of the comics $20 that were there. Plus then we, you know, split the rest of it with the two that were traveling through. So everyone got a little bit of money, not anything you're going to write home about. I mean, when you're doing five minutes, I think you <laughs> right. just kind of know that right. 20 bucks for five minutes exactly. translates to about, bad. what is that, like $400 yeah. an hour? Yeah, like, sure. You're, yeah. you're not, not, not in a bad spot. You just don't yeah. have enough material or the, you know, the well, skill level to develop out and do a, a 20 minute set, but yeah. warrant a little bit more. But also, you want to yeah. take care of the talent. Yeah, I just want to at least give people, give people a little bit of, you know, a little bit of feeling like they belong and are, are getting paid for their, for their art. That's one of the toughest things, you know, and I think you and I ran into that when I was like, Hey, I really like, I love that you're doing all this stuff for us, but like, I feel bad because I couldn't give you any money. I'm like, I want, and you're like, no, I want to help you. And, uh, you know, I actually talked to my therapist about that today at therapy today. Uh, I talked about oh, my comedian who does therapy. That's yeah, weird. Well, well, I think we all should be doing therapy. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, I talked about, we, we talked about the festival, like, what do you feel? Like, how are you feeling? You know, we're working on my feelings. I got to talk about my feelings. Bro, I had two therapists uh, at one point. I was like, this is my therapist for work shit. And this is my therapist for yeah. the issues I have from growing up, yeah. getting bullied and yeah. this, that, and the other thing. And so, you know, I, I talked about, I, I'd mentioned, uh, I mentioned people who had given to the, to the festival and like, I'm like, and, and she's like, yeah, but haven't you given like your stuff, like haven't you hosted things for free? Haven't you done this for free? And I was right. like, yeah, all the time. And she's like, yeah, other people want to do that for you too. It's okay. And I'm like, all right, thanks. <laughs> Is there a difference between the summer class in terms of the number of weeks you get to prep and then the fall class? For stand-up? Yeah, for stand-up. Uh, yeah, so all of our stand-up and our improv classes at the theater for adults all run on just six-week cycles. Okay. So usually it's six weeks on um, with then a showcase and then two weeks off, uh, six weeks on, two weeks off. So that runs. So we do four, six of them throughout the uh, year. Two during the fall and the spring So semester. we do two fall, two spring, two summer. Do you have a, a one that you feel like packs out a little bit more than others? Or I um, like some, summer can kind of be like a ghost town in this area when it comes to that. But Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, our late fall, it's hard because we're so new, right? So this is only our second that we'll finally be getting into our third year. So I can finally start to see trends. Right. Uh, just because I'm the business manager. That's kind of my background. I'm an economist, like by trade. Yeah. So we're I'm finally getting enough data to kind of say like, oh, this is how things are, are looking. You know, our best, our best session was late fall of last year. Um, but this summer is going to be pretty close to that because we have 11 people signed up for stand up, seven people in level four and nine people in level two. What are um, the levels? Uh, so for improv, for improv, we have uh, four levels of, of okay, class. Where you're at in terms uh, of like. Yeah. So I have like intro to improv and then it's like all character based. Then it's all, um, you know, what we call game based. And then it's like finding your own form. And then we have auditions. Like there's a whole process on the improv side of things. With stand up, we were we initially wanted to do the same thing where we would have uh, writing and performing stand up comedy as like intro to stand up. Right. Then if you took that and you felt like you wanted to do more, then we were going to have intermediate stand up. Uh, so we offered that, and we got like six people that took intro to take that class, but everyone just wanted to write new material. Like no one wanted to work on their old stuff. Uh, okay. Yeah, they don't want to refine what they've been doing yeah. in the first round, and, and which makes sense because. You know, this isn't New York, this isn't LA, this isn't Chicago, this isn't Toronto. People aren't moving here to be a professional comedian. Right, right, right. A lot of people are doing it kind of like what you did, what you and Jason did. Hey, I want it, something I'm interested in. I want to get better at it and I want to like use this somewhere else. Uh, we get a lot of graduate students who are interested in becoming better presenters for their research. So they know that improv and stand up will help with that. So no one's like, for at least what we've noticed in the stand up is not many people want to do five minutes. And then the next level, take that five minutes and like cut it down to three and then build a little more and right. then, then do 10 minutes. That's not kind of what the path they want. Uh, now that we're getting big enough uh, of a program, we might start to institute something like here is your standard class. And the goal of this class is you will write five minutes. You'll perform it in front of an audience. And then we will have elective or advanced classes. And those will change topic every time. 
you know, okay, maybe, how, are you, how do you want to shift it? Right. So I, I would love to teach a class that's just about hosting, like being an MC. Gotcha. So it would be, you know, you would learn how to greet the audience and how do you talk to the audience? How do you introduce people? So it'd be kind of getting that angle of it. Maybe do one that's focused more on, um, comedic styles. So at the beginning you pick a, a famous comedian and you have to do it in their style. Uh, maybe one is reflection. So you look at your old set and you can only do jokes you've only done before. Right. We just rewrite them. So try to have more, you know, it's like a, the, the education of just basic college. You have your electives after you've taken the, yeah. the core. So I don't know. We're thinking of different ways to think of different ways to make it better. I just want more opportunities for people to, to do it. Yeah, I feel like have you guys considered maybe like carpooling and taking over other areas as a means of like a almost to keep it in line with the you know that class feel of having yeah. like the class field trip where we're like hey we're going to Pittsburgh <laughs> and we're playing this it's just it's a two hour drive and we're gonna be here at noon and we're gonna go and fuck around in the town yeah. for a little while and then we're gonna go to this club and we're gonna all gonna you know we're all gonna be the opening set for somebody who's coming through who's actually gonna like bill it out is that like yeah. an option um I've I've thought of going and doing open mics and Jason and I have talked about yeah uh, he, he's mentioned that to we me. we've talked about just like going to Harrisburg or Philly for the evening and trying to hit up a mic or two to, um, I hadn't thought of, you know, I could connect with other theaters and say, Hey, we've got folks that would be interested in getting some stage time. Do you want to do a swap sees or something like right, you guys that kind of a deal? Yeah. I mean, it, uh, even if they don't being like, you know, are you looking if, if they want to refresh their crowd of like who they have coming in to perform, it's nice that if it'd be like once a month, you did a field trip, you were like, Hey, right. one month, a, a you know, or one, one weekend a month or one night a month, you're going to be able to have a, a roster of people that aren't from your area that are going to be a lot of familiar faces that people see, yeah. like you can have them all. Also, but you can also have your, you know, your national talent, whoever's performing, and yeah. then you've got some new openers, some fresh blood to kind of like mix in there. Uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, you're like, you, you know, I'll let you take the comedy class for free if you want to. And I was <laughs> like, I don't know. But now the more I've thought about it, I, I thought back over the last like week about how I enjoyed the class because part yeah. of it was you've got a regimen, right? So I think in any art, it's important to have sort of discipline with the creative process. And that is the part that most creatives have a hard time with is Absolutely. the discipline. And, and I'm like... I'm preaching to my own choir at this point because I am constantly doing so many different things. It's hard to sit down and isolate and do one individual thing. And so I've started to, again, make space for those things in my my day-to-day. -day. And one of the things I really enjoyed was there was no ifs, ands, or buts at the end of well, – was it – we was class two times a week? Once a week. Once a week. And then – but yeah, but like every week every you knew you were building towards your, your minute, your two minute, your three minute, yep. your four minute, your five minute. And – uh, like to me, that was really good because it, it forced me to be prepared. And there was like, I think like the second class or something like that. I had, I didn't start writing my bit until like that day, but I was more passionate about it than I was the one that I had been writing for a while to get to my one minute. Yeah. So by the time I did my two minute, I was like, I was feeling more excited and energetic about doing it. And so I guess part of what was also good about the class was that I got to experience the different sort of like emotional fundamental dynamics that you go through whenever you're right. in that, you know, oh, oh shit, I've got a show and it's going to be, you know, even if you're only in front of the, the class is also a weird litmus test, right? Because they're also all trying to do this. Correct. And so it's not the same as an audience who's going somewhere and has had a few drinks and is there specifically to laugh and, and like can't, they almost can't wait to hear what you're going to go on yeah. about. Uh, but there is also something really strengthening about the vulnerability of being in front of a bunch of other, not that they're critical of you, but they are there to kind of like yeah. analyze and help you kind of like work through your strengths and weaknesses of a set. And the writer's group is also like fundamentally also a part of that. Um, so I think I, I, I wanted to do one. I did the summer one last time and I think there was a, there were like one or two dudes in the class that were, <laughs> they were buzz kills for me when it came to yeah. like being able to be like, oh, Okay. And then they did really well at the actual showcase. I was like, where did these people come from? These were not here the last six weeks. Like, what? But uh, I would like to take one, I think, in the fall. I think sure. I, was, I was thinking about taking the, the late fall one. Come on. Come hang out. You know, it's I, it's exactly what you said. It, just, it forces you to do things. Um, and I try to come up with new exercises, new creative writing exercises and joke writing exercises every single time. So that way it's not just exactly the same every six weeks. Uh, because there are people who just take it every single time. They're just like, hey, this is what I do. Like, And then they come up with a new five minutes and sometimes they'll use some old jokes or they'll change things. But you know, they have expressed the exact same thing. Like if I, I want to do this and if I know that people are depending on me, not really depending, but right. they expect you to have two minutes next week, I'm going to actually spend time to do it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it's having the assignment. Like I remember in graduate school, 
the first day of one of my econometrics classes, like a very hard class, the professor the first day said, I don't want you all to put pressure on yourself. Everyone in here will get a B plus no matter what. And the first thing I did was say, oh, well, I guess I don't need to pay attention anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Like there was no pressure. <laughs> and no, I I've officially checked. The I did out. not, you know, I was, that was not the way that I, I learned. I need, I need to get stickers <laughs> and put them in little boxes that say, hey, I did this. I did this. Do you feel like, uh, I wanted to kind of get into like uh, one of the sort of like core tenets that you got you guys preached at Blue Brick was, you know, the art of not punching down mm-hmm. and really kind of like selectively, cho- you, like you didn't want to punch down. And I know that that's like controversial to kind of talk about in the, the comedic yeah. landscape because a lot of people w- would say like, oh, well, isn't that kind of limiting comedy if yeah. you're not, uh, or is it maybe not even being inclusive to not include other people? And, and part of it's like, a, there's so much that goes into that, right? And so I guess from like a business perspective, it just makes sense to be like, let's keep this clean here. This is not LA where we're going to have an you know inundation of nonstop people trying to get in to kind of work through becoming a comic. But Right. It also feels like it's a, a values and a principle thing for Blue Brick. Correct. Yeah. It's more, it's, it's definitely a, a values thing. And it's a, we want, we want people to, to be creative and be smart about it. Right. And we want to create a culture that when you come in to the theater to watch a show that we are producing, that you're not going to, leave feeling icky like our like <laughs> right. like our our mission is to bring joy to the state college community right and you know i have a tough time when people are like well you know oh it's comedy and like if people can't like if you can't cut it like don't worry like who cares they're offended i was like well i if I want, care <laughs> i care like and, and not, i don't even know if it's business wise it's it's more like if i have a group if i have a if I have a room of 50 people, I want as many of those 50 people to feel welcome and to have a good time because the world sucks. And like <laughs> the last thing I need is for someone on stage who we've had sometimes come through with wisecrackers that will just sit there and do misogynistic or racist or, you know, fat phobia type jokes. And then you could just see half the audience like check out and you're like, well, I didn't do my mission. My goal, my goal is to my, my goal is to bring joy to state college community and to people that don't experience it all the time. And so we really want to build that as part of the culture, both in improv, both in stand up. And we don't hit, you know, we don't hit the bar all the time. Um, and that's okay. Like that's the idea with both improv and stand up is you will make mistakes. And as long as you learn from those and we figure out where this is and, and, and what is, and I'm sure in 20 years, we'll look back at some of the jokes we're doing now and be like, man, I can't believe I said that. Right. 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 Like go back to the 1990s, like watch some of Chris Rock stuff from the nineties or, you know, Seinfeld, anything that at the time was like, this is best comedy. You look at it now, you're like, wow, that didn't age well. Watch friends. You'll be like, Ooh, like some of that stuff. (laughs) Like rough, right. Um, so I'm sure in 20 years there'll be that too, but can we continue to grow? Can we, can we continue to, um, progress and what we have in in our improv handbook, we talk a lot about uh, the intent of the joke. What is right? Are you intentionally trying to demean someone? And like, if that's the case, like why? And like, let's dig deep into that. And do you think that's the way it should be? <laughs> so there's a, there's a thing that you <laughs> right? do that I think is really interesting. Uh, and I noticed it. I took. I think it was like right after I got done in the class. I was like, oh, I went to one of the Sunday writers yeah. groups, and. Uh, I have to use you for context for this. Sure. So this is because it's two prime examples of of two different people trying to make a joke around the same sort of subject matter. And one was executed really well. And it wasn't necessarily like more or less raunchy. But uh, the the kid, I, I hadn't seen him at the writing class. I don't know if he'd taken the writing class. I think he might have just been like there for the writer's group to be able to test some stuff out because yeah. it's like a, a passion that he has and he wants to do it. Um, but clearly not same shared values and that's whatever. But he went up and he was making a joke about threesomes with his girlfriend and how like it was not that it was like chauvinistic or, or misogynistic necessarily. It's that the joke the joke was not really crafted very well and so it didn't work. And, and without butchering it, I wanted to ask you if you could tell the one that you that you do about oh. <laughs> uh, the threesome joke. Because I think to uh, me, it was really, really funny. And it it kind of activates that idea of what your intent behind the joke is and yeah. how you can kind of touch on the subject material in a way that's funny. Yeah. And I, and I think it, it ends up also being, what is the butt of the joke? If I remember correctly, the butt of the joke that that guy was doing was like the girlfriend or the other guy, right? Like that's the butt of the, of the joke. Uh, my uh, polyamorous joke that I- You're that the I butt of the joke. Is- 
you know, it's something along the lines of I, you know, I've got friends that are moving in, which is a true story. I've got our friends that are moving into town and uh, we're so excited. You're from here. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you live here, uh, but you probably have a bunch of friends that move in and then move away. Of course. Move away. Right. We live in a transient town. I moved here nine years ago. I've had way more friends move away than like move in. Only like a couple. <laughs> right. But I have two friends moving in, so they don't know anybody else here. So we did a bunch of stuff for them. We have mowed their lawn for them. They had to buy their house early. So we had all their packages delivered to us. We went and, um, Went and we actually went to Paws, which is a local nonprofit. We looked at a dog that they were interested. Like we did all this stuff for them. And when they moved in, we brought them dinner. We helped them unpack. Uh, and they're like very grateful, but I'm pretty sure they think we're trying to fuck them. Right? Like <laughs> yeah. that's, that's to some stuff. degree, you can only right. be so nice. You can only be so nice to be, you know. And you know, the way I wrote that joke was just kind of like you're so nice to people, and because it's it's coming really truly from me. Like I love to like please everybody. Like I'm trying to do everything. So when Bryce and Andrea have decided they're going to move here. Like I'll text them every other day. Like, Hey, like when are you moving? Like what's going on? Like, do, do you need anything? Right. And it comes to the point of what are they thinking? And that's one of the exercises that we run at the blue brick theater with stand up. Uh, and when we start to do sketch, we haven't done any sketch yet, but we're going to is one of the most basic writing exercises is okay. You are in some sort of situation. What else in that situation uh, could have feelings? Right. For example, let's take the situation we're in right now. Right. If I was writing jokes about this, the first step I would take is I would look around. And I'd say, okay, this microphone, like if this microphone had feelings, like what would it think? Like this guy just yelled fucking to me. Right. Like that's <laughs> like, they probably aren't microphones only get talked to. They never get to <laughs> express their own thing. Right. And a lot of comedy comes from, I've experienced this. What are the other things that are, are around it? Right. Um, so yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't think there's any, I don't, I don't believe there are any topics that cannot be discussed on stage. Uh, like I the just, intent behind it. Certainly. I think it's the intent behind it. I think it's, you know, I, I I think in one of the podcasts, one of these podcasts I listened to, you had talked about trying a different podcast, and it just became like three white dudes talking about racism, and it's like, why are we having three white guys talking about racism? Yeah, it was like not the right? not the exactly. avenue I was trying to go, and and yeah. it's not even like I don't think that you know three white dudes can't contribute positive discourse right. towards the discussion. It's that it feels disingenuous that there's not somebody else on the panel to kind of curb check that that is a person of color to be able to like contribute and and talk back to it. So it's like that was, I was like, this is not direct. And it's like, no matter what we did, it kept coming up. I was like, right. do we have some things we got to talk about <laughs> off camera? guys? like, what are, how Perhaps. are we fucking feeling right now? Yeah. And uh, yeah. So in the line of offensive humor, do you feel like there's a line that comedians shouldn't cross when it comes to making jokes about sensitive topics? Like these are things um, that are obviously like, you know, race, you know, religion, I, you know, I gender believe, identity. I believe that's up to I believe that's up to the individual and up to the individual venue. Um, yeah. And that is, you know, I I don't want to take away from anyone's freedom of speech, but I also have the right as a theater owner to not promote that. <laughs> right, right, uh, right. And that's really what I say on the first day of class is I I say there's you know, you you can go you can go invest thousands of hours and tens of thousands of dollars into opening your own comedy club so you can say racist shit. Right. Um, so, but until you do that, if you want this stage, right, right, you know, right. like it's mine. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a, that happens anyway. Like we played venues yeah. where they don't want you to swear. Yeah. And so, and in the realm of rock and metal musicians, yeah. it's like very commonplace to hear a, an F bomb on stage. Right. And so, uh, I mean, I've definitely, and, and for some reason that agitates people being told that they can or can't say something, regardless <laughs> of, of whether or not of they realize that they have signed the contract that says that they will abide by venue roles. And, uh, you know, and then they'll eat the fine because they're like, you'd rather say buck and get and pay, you know, $500 for doing that than not. Mm -hmm. Like, that's how important the ability to say, like, I guess when you're picking your battles, it's like, it's not a battle against free speech. This is like a venue that's asking you not to do it because right. maybe it's an all ages show and like, it's, yeah. it's not fundamentally necessary. And like, I'm the kind of person where if we're somewhere and I, I say, I curse or something like that. And I, and somebody notices that there's kids around, they'll like, yo, hey, psh. I'm like, oh. My yeah. bad. I usually, uh, and almost unanimously, this is probably something I'll work into a bit eventually. And I'm always like, oh shit. And I literally, it's like the first thing I say is another swear word right. because I realize that I messed up and I don't want to. And then I just involuntarily do it anyway. Yeah. I love when kids show up to our improv shows and we're like, well, well you guys have a, a kid improv group, don't you? We do. Our youth, our youth improv, or our youth improv group is, is phenomenal. Uh, it is one of the most rewarding things that we offer. The lucky bastards. Know? I know. They have so right? much to grow up with and be able to so kind of pull from. They have so much to grow up with. And they, 
You know, they they have that opportunity. To, I, I didn't know what improv was until I got to college. You know, like, like we've got I mean, whose line is it anyway? It was on TV at the time, so right. it's like that to some degree. We had that, right? We've got you know we've got sixth graders who are going up and doing full long form sets and like expressing Crushing characters it. and learning about collaboration and learning about being uh, accepting and building and saying yes and like we have all this stuff going on, which is uh, which is spectacular. And you know, you talked earlier about you know. For the for the young musician, yeah, they can go into a basement or a garage, but there's not a rock location, right? It's not right. like Stage West is opening up their doors all the time to have local Battle of the Bands or anything like that. But I will say, recently I have discovered there are a couple places in here. Um, I cannot remember the name of Silly Goose Booking. Okay. Is, uh, uh, I want to say her name was... I'm butchering this. I want to say Melody, but I don't think that's it. Uh, <laughs> she was really, really sweet. Whatever her name was, I'll, I'll, I have it in my phone. I texted her to try to talk to her about setting up shows. I went to sort of like what I remember from my heyday in high school of going to a house basement show. And it's like yeah. – and it was packed. There were like four bands that played and they were from all over. One of the, Two of them from out of town. And I want to say there were maybe like 100 and 150 kids packed into this basement. So it's that's those shows are fun to play. I would almost rather play the show to that many people in a small and packed in room than to have half half capacity, you know, yeah. of a, a thousand cap venue. And uh, and then there's another one called Your Mom's House is what mm, they call it. Wonderful. And so they're like pop ups. Like this, yeah. it's not like they this, they go to different locations, but they actually set up shows in these basements and there's very limited capacity and it's very much so only word of mouth, uh, you know, uh, promotion for getting people to go to these shows and they're doing really, really well. So to me, that is indicative of the fact that there is a market for this here. Oh, yeah. There's just no way to get them to the business owners have a, you know, a bottom line that what they need to make okay. to do a show. And I, I constantly get hit up by friends that are promoters or people from all over the country that are like, hey, I've got a band coming through. Do you want to set up a show for this date? And I'm like, you know that this is summer in State College. Like, it's very hard to get a, a show to kind of pack out in the middle of the summer. Right. Um, but to see that those things are happening, I'm like, okay, so there is a market for this here. That's the reason why we almost do need this, like – we, it hasn't been developed yet, but we need this one like 200 cap venue right. that is just adequately sized and set up right. And to me, I think that that is not an impossible ask of this mm -hmm. area. So it's like, what what is the beginning of the avenue you have to go down to start getting people to see that this is like a, it's just a crucial like beginning step to what can grow onto the better and bigger things. If you develop these younger bands or younger comedians in, and younger improv groups in these, you know, 150, 200 cap rooms – We've got bigger rooms in here. We have like we have an inundation of six hundred cap rooms yeah, in this absolutely. this area for a place that doesn't want to book artists that sell those venues out. So I'm like, can we at least start developing so that like you know as you garner this sort of rep recognition and attention for yourselves that you can have a place to kind of upscale to outside of having to travel outside of town, which I I think is also an important part a rite of passage if you will mm -hmm. as a creative or an entertainer in general to you have to kind of break out of your home oh uh, yeah you know, your hometown to, to perform. But, uh, man, it's just like it drives me insane that we we don't really have a, a thing in that area. And, and I feel like I know 20 of the right people that if I could get to go in as a joint venture <laughs> on something, we could pull something off. But it's like I also don't want to bare bones it. I want to actually right. – I want one venue that is done justice the way it should be. And I don't know if you've been following like uh, in Austin, that comedy scene is blowing up right mm -hmm. now. Joe Rogan started the Comedy Mothership and right. uh, Brian Redband started – he took over a venue or he, he started a venue. It's, I think it's either right next door, right across the street. And now like in a certain area of Austin, there's like a bunch of comedy clubs yeah. and people can come into the area, big ticket names and also like up and coming comedians and basically walk the strip and do five minutes at each set and yeah. go from like venue to venue. And I'm like, okay, I can't ask for that to be ha happening here when I'm just barely asking for one place to exist right. in the first place. But it's evidence that, you know, I think um, I can't speak for him, but like Joe's, uh, I think goal was to have a really adequately laid out venue that could handle all of the things that he loved about some of his favorite venues all over the place. And I think Louis C.K. came in and kind of like consulted a little bit and offered some suggestions for certain rooms, lowering the ceilings in certain rooms and and really kind of like size appropriate tertiary little rooms and big rooms. You know, you have like a big cap room and you've got the smaller rooms to kind of test some stuff out in. And and that's just proof that if you have this idea or this goal in mind and you actually set out to execute in a way that it's going to – it can succeed because almost by design it was meant to succeed, we could do it in this yeah. area. We just haven't figured out a way to connect enough of the dots to get us there, I guess. Yeah, I mean it – 
a lot of it just comes down to overall money and financing and what are people willing to to pay to come out all the time right. um and you know we we set our tickets at a very reasonable price super reasonable 15 dollars a ticket you know right. with discounts given uh, and it's BYOB, so and it's not super like liberal with the discounts given correct. part of the Very ticket. liberal. I'm the worst business owner uh, <laughs> ever, ever in the entire history of business owners, uh, because everyone could just be like, "Hey, can I come in?" And I'll be like, "Sure, whatever." Like, hey, I had a rough in. week this week. Oh, I didn't get exactly. paid yet. You're like, get, you know, get at your the, ass at in the here. end of the day, uh, and, and until it becomes a, a necessary, like I need to make money off of it. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to build and just trying to grow, uh, and. Everybody that I know, I have lots of friends who own improv or stand up clubs around the country. I'm sure you're meeting more by the and I'm thousands more every time of day, right? The thing is, is all of them they make their money on the bar because yeah. people are willing to come and you know spend fifty, sixty dollars buying drinks after a show or before a show or during a show, and that's what kind of funds all the other stuff. And you're not going to get that in Pennsylvania because of the super awful conservative commonwealth commonwealth <laughs> laws of all the things and so like until i find a way to get someone to give me two million dollars to buy a liquor license right and then set up that type of thing how's that for a barrier to entry <laughs> right um you know i would i mean and maybe that's something that will happen at some point i've had people talk to me that are like hey i do you think that if we had a hundred and let's say you could seat with tables 150 or you could move everything away and do like 250 theater style like do you think that that would be successful and i was like you know as we continue to grow i think that could be successful if we were connected with a tiny kitchen that could do apps and stuff and had a bar where we could have waitresses and you have like the actual comedy club feel until that it's going to be a small black box theater, which is perfectly fine, which is lovely. Like, I mean, the blue brick is, it does what it needs to do, but it can't do much more. Right. Um, and it's not going well, to. I mean, I think about, uh, you know, not too many moons ago, there was uh, Spats Cafe was yep. basically serving food to the Rathskeller. Mm -hmm. And so that was, now it's what, Doggy's Pub. So Correct. like that was something that was clearly in the works and, and was able to function that way. I can't imagine you guys are no further away from right, Cafe from 210. Cafe. I feel like there's uh, some sort of liaising that needs to take place to make something like that happen. Sledgehammer through the wall and just get that to, yeah, don't think we won't to come on down. Like that's, that's, that's fine. Uh, where Spats Cafe was, that place is up for lease again. And I always, every time I go by it, I go, Hmm. Mm. Cause like that, then, then we just flip. Right. So, right. Like, you know, is, does doggies be able to share that that license with it? You know, I always have I always have all the ideas. You know, the uh, the hookah lounge was uh, got sold to a different hookah lounge. It's still the same thing. Uh, the one that's right by five right guys. Right by five guys. Yeah. Oh, man. And at one point, I went down there when they were like trying to sell it. Someone texted me. It's like, hey, would you be interested in buying this? And I was like, ah, oh, let me. I'm just gonna go look at it. I'm like, I don't think so, but I'm gonna go look at it. And I'm like, oh, this is so cool. Like, you walk down. Like, it's such a and which is what I love about the Blue Brick Theater too. It's in an alleyway. It's exposed brick. It like you yeah. when you walk out, you're back in an alley. It feels like you know you're in a much larger city than you are. Right. So I love like I think the vibes are important when it comes to a Certainly. lot of this type of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, aesthetics definitely matter, man. Especially in that case. And and I would say that I wish you had almost gone in on that because that <laughs> that hookah place does have a decent size like. Uh, corner stage yeah and there is some seating in that area it could be adjusted to be like way better right. there's some like pillar structural support mm -hmm. stuff around there but uh man it, it's also i would also say not the ideal layout no. for, for something you'd want to have some like depth and volume of people being able to sit yeah. there and watch something and not have it be a bunch of you know chairs in a row where people are sitting as opposed to you know, tables where they could kind of be sitting and having drinks and like eating and whatnot. Yeah. And that's why, you know, where the this spats thing though, I'm big, that <laughs> one's got me intrigued. Cause I, I I'm, I am like the ultimate fuck around and find out game player over here. Like I'd love <laughs> to go down there and say, Hey, like, they, I mean, they do bands at doggies and they mostly do them outside, but then right. they have uh, they do have like that stage that, just down in the corner. Yeah, I did. St we did stand up there once. That was our first ever stand up show was in doggies. Really? Yeah. In t uh, spring of 2019. Before we had our own location, we did a stand-up class there. That was where the showcase was, and it was it was super cool. But Spats hollowed out is uh, 
that's a prime venue Spot right there. Out. Uh, so I just saw that some, I have no idea who it is, which uh, I just saw it today. So I'll be making some texts and some phone calls. The old Bar Blue. Um, oh, yeah, Beulah's for, Barbecue or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah Bar Blue. Uh, it has now has a big leased sign over it, and I saw people doing work in there. So that'll be interesting because they had downstairs. You remember you'd go downstairs yeah. and there's like a small stage yeah. in there. Uh, very tight, but like I could see putting like 30 or 40 people to watch an improv or stand-up show like while like everyone's still at the bar. Um, but I I don't want to run <laughs> I don't want to run a 5,000 square foot bar. Right, right, right. Simultaneously. I want to I want to run like a 2,000 or 3,000 square foot. There's a little bar and 100 people watch stand watch a comedy show. So aside from the entrepreneurial endeavors that it comes it like absolutely requires to kind of, uh, you know, be able to develop something like this. I feel like it's also come from like a labor of love for you. Cause like, it's something that you clearly didn't jump into because you're like, well, I think I can make it happen. Listen, I make a hundred dollars a week from the theater. (laughs) You're like, and I believe me, I live fat (laughs) off of that. So fat off of it. No, we, uh, yeah. Um, you know, I'm in a super, super privileged position that my wife, uh, has, uh, she's a school psychologist uh, and makes decent money. We're not rolling in dough by any means, but she has good health insurance and a retirement account. Um, we, you know, were very lucky in the timing of buying our first house, which allowed us to take a lot of money and buy our second house, which is now walkable to downtown. And we are not having children. <laughs> so that saves us money. So I can, you know, I could, I did, I left my job at Penn State, which was, you know, a decent salary and great benefits. And we aren't going to struggle. Uh, Now we're not going to be traveling the world and we're not going to be, you know, going out to fancy dinners every, every night. But what that means is instead I, I can put 20 hours a week, 30 hours a week towards trying to build a comedy culture and community in state college uh, and not get paid very much for it. But um, it's like one of those necessary evils, right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it, we, when, whenever we teach a class, we pay ourselves a little more than that. Every time we do a workshop, we pay ourselves a little bit um, from it. Um, I'm starting to get other gigs based off of off of it, like going to other places to run workshops or, you know, more MC gigs around town as people get to know me. So there's, you know, resources come in, in different ways. Uh, but I spend the other, you know, 20 hours a week running my education business where, you know, I'll charge families, you know, over a hundred dollars an hour to meet with their kid and teach them economics or SAT math or whatever. Right, right, right. Uh, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. If I, it's, you know, people, some people grow up and they want to just make all the money in the world. And I was never that type of person that's like, my success is going to be determined by the $150,000 job that I have working executive thing as finance in LA or in Orange County or in New York. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm right there with you. Because I could, like, it's, you know, I'm, I, I feel like I could, I don't know, maybe that's just my mediocre white guy uh, confidence coming out, but <laughs> I, I feel like I could. I feel like I could make some calls and get a job making ninety to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars tomorrow, and like, so if I'm not doing that, I must not want to. And this is what I want to do. Yeah, I mean, certainly at the end of the day, you got to put your head on your pillow <laughs> and enjoy it. So, I mean, I, there's something to be said for, uh, you know, I traded uh, a stable income and you know a job and a paycheck for the ability to chase my dreams, and yep. like I think to me. Uh, for the developing years, when I first started, I remember getting a lot of flack for it because when you're chasing your dreams, people seem to have every opportunity in the world to tell you why you shouldn't be doing that and why you should maybe be doing this other thing that pays you a little bit better. But what they don't tell you is that if you're not happy in doing that, every one of those days that you just wasted working for that paycheck can't be gotten back. And Mm -hmm. you don't know what you're going to experience by going down that rabbit hole, that avenue. And in doing that, you know, I I had a job offer with um, some government agencies whenever I got out of undergrad at Penn State. And I love the idea of doing it. But at the same time, I was like, I mean, the pay is like 50 grand a year. And yeah, it's full benefits, but I got to relocate every two years. And I'm 23 and a hopeless romantic. So how am I ever going to get somebody to fall in love with me and want to move to wherever it is I got to move across the country or globe maybe uh, in two years? And 
I think I'm just going to take a year and do some soul searching and then uh, I'll come back. And the jobs, some of the jobs I was applying for, they were only open every two years. And so I didn't take them. And I remember uh, the, and all of them were eight-year contracts. That was the other thing. I was like, damn, I was like, I'm 23 and I'm going to sign this eight-year contract. I'll be 31. And I remember uh, a tour that I was doing in other Europe or maybe Asia. Maybe I was in Russia. I graduated in 2008. And so I guess it would have been, if it was 20, yeah, about eight years later, 2016. So um, I want to say that was an Olympic year, I want to say. So I feel like the Sochi Olympics in Russia, and I was in Russia. And so I'm in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And I was like, you know, here I was worried at 23 that I was giving up my opportunity to travel the globe and make money. And here I am right. having been doing it for the last several years. Yeah. And also, like, I am I think I'm happier for it because I wasn't working for somebody else. And I was giving myself the opportunity to kind of, you know, meet people in other countries in ways that I wouldn't have met them if I was there doing a job for somebody else. And, yeah. you know, you're just doing it as sort of like, oh, yeah, I'll see, I'll see the local fair and everybody whenever I go out to dinner with the client or this or the whatever. And it's not the same as like really fully integrating and kind of being a part of it. We do a lot of um, philanthropy when we go into areas now and we travel to new areas. We're yeah. like, hey, let's – what's a park we can go and clean up trash for like an hour at and, you know, just kind of – do something locally to kind of help out. And I, I like doing that and no, it doesn't pay anything. No. And I mean, I remember, uh, on the Vans warp tour, there's this place outside of Columbia, Maryland, where there was like a park that they would have people go and, uh, pick out trash from like the water and all like the areas in the Chesapeake Bay area. And I like every year, everybody came down with like the plague after they went and did it. I was like, <laughs> I get we're doing a public service here. This one seems a little this one's sus. Too much. Yes, too much. I think that we and, and we're talking about a squad of like 160 something people descending on an area. And then like the following, you know, we're barely halfway through the tour. And then you've got three, Everyone's four weeks dropping of, out. Oh man, like flies. You just have people like missing their sets or like the singer has to have another singer from another band sing his set because he's dunzo for a week and uh it was really really bad but it was something that it kind of instilled like it was good to go into other areas and do that and i'm the kind of guy that like if i get broken up with and i'm really really sad i'm like i'm gonna go find a soup kitchen and serve to some people that mm -hmm. are you know experiencing homelessness and and do it in a way where it's like you know what this is uh it's not even like i get anything out of it other than the gratification of being like i'm able to help somebody else yeah. and it distracts me from whatever menial dumb shit that i think is actually a problem for me and really is like nothing compared to somebody who's got an entire experience going on that That's i'm not a, a part of very positive coping mechanism yeah i mean if you if you were in pain and you don't see the value in going and helping other people yeah. I can't help you. Like, it's literally one of the best things you can do because it pulls you out of your, oh, poor me bullshit and lets right. you go into a place where you're like, hey, I can uh, I can actually do some good here even though I feel like shit and I don't really want to do anything but cry into a pillow for the next six hours or whatever. Uh, I, I, I don't know where that came from because it's not like my uh, family upbringing. We didn't do a lot of, like, community service work or anything like no. that. So it was just something that – I dated some girls in high school and in undergrad that I definitely were of – that ilk of character and that's some, where it came from yeah if it rubs off i was like yeah it's not a bad thing to have rub off all on, of yeah. my music tastes are from the women that i dated in high school and college <laughs> i like the i like <laughs> to think that i'm the reason for their music taste developing whenever see like i i tell people this and then they think i'm an absolute weirdo but i i don't really have music preferences and like I know so many people who are like, love music, which I know you do. Yeah. And so many people are just like, music is like the heart and soul of life and awesome. And then I sit here and I'm like, I could go without music the rest of my life. Like if there's never another song, like I would be okay. <laughs> and everyone looks at me like you Get just Get the fuck did. out of here. I know, right? <laughs> uh, I figured I'd wait till about an, uh, over an hour into the podcast before, right, I, before I mentioned I got it. Kicked out. But people like, people will try and drill it like, what do you mean? And it's like, I don't know. Like I just... It was never a big thing in my family growing up. Like there was like they had the radio on, whatever the local thing was. So what ended up happening was, you know, the first girl I really dated in high school that liked music was a Dave Matthews band. And so guess what? I know the words to every Dave Matthews band <laughs> song, right? And the next one was super into Evanescence. So like then that's on my playlist. That's so the funny. next one loved something corporate and Jack's mic. So like I'm like my whole range of music that I will listen to is just the weirdest mix and people ask why and it's clear it's all it is and stuff we're working through with the therapy um <laughs> i try to conform to others and try and bring people in where does that come from i don't know we're still trying to figure that out uh, <laughs> but just like it. pleasing other people is like very much in uh my dna and it comes out in some weird ways 
uh, which is which is that. Like for example, I, I listened to three of your podcasts today before I came here because right. I was like, I need to make sure I got to be burst. And I'm so sorry that you had to go. There. Which ones did you listen to? Um, I listened to one, two, and then uh, eleven because that's that's Jason and Jason. And I I started with Jason Brown as my. Uh, as my housemate. Oh yeah, I didn't know he was your housemate. Yeah, Jason's lived with us wow, for like holy three years now. Shit, small world. His whole studio is in our basement. We did during the pandemic. We used to do a TV show, me, him, and Kim, called the Jockey Jaw Show, where we would do once a week, forty-five minutes, just kind of like a variety thing that we would stream to Facebook. And then Arts Fest for two years, we had bands in our basement playing during Arts Fest for the virtual thing. And like Center Gaze, we did a ton of stuff in our basement during, like we should have got COVID way earlier. Like I remember <laughs> the first one. So this was like 2020, like summer 2020 when it was like, there's no vaccines or anything. Out. Right, right, right. Velveeta came, played in our basement. There was like seven of them. And like Jason and I are just sitting there with our masks on like, well, we're going to see what happens. And luckily, <laughs> that like, is so like two funny. doors open. Yeah, it was it was fun. We we were we raised money for for three dots and for local uh, musicians. So we had like Jason Adams that came in and Luke Zimbala that came in, and, um, you know, uh, Karen Dixon, like all of like the, the singer songwriters were were coming through the basement and just like doing their set and we would set up a Venmo and try and get them a couple hundred bucks here or there. So, so yeah. And then we've, you know, we filmed some comedy stuff down there. He does all of his streaming. Um, it was, it was weird. He used to live on Pew, which is close to where I live when we first started hanging out. And then his roommate, Larry, I don't know if you ever met Larry. I don't think so. Uh, he took my first stand up class and he was taking improv classes. Then he moved to Philly. So Jason was like, oh, I'm looking for a new place. And my wife and I had just bought our house on Waring Avenue in the borough. Now, three bedroom, two and a half bath. And it was just my wife and I and our two dogs. Right, right, right. Like, we were like, dude. Let's subsidize some like, of this. You, you want, you, you like, we got a room? And he's like, he's like, oh, I'll live in the basement. I'm like, first of all, no. Like, <laughs> I am not going to be. I'm not going to be the middle-aged white man that has a black man living in his basement. You <laughs> yeah, have a yeah. room. Like, you Think have a room, optics, Jason. Jason. Come on, damn optics. I can't have you living on a, in an unfinished basement right, on a cement right, right. floor. Uh, so you can have a room. Please take a room and a bathroom. Um, and, you know, at that time, he was, you know, he was he was working at Penn State and the radio and everything. Uh, and it's it's awesome. I think it, I think it was, uh, during the pandemic, it was, it was great. Because that meant that we had our own little bubble. Right, right, so right. So we had right. the three of us that yes. was great because if it was just my wife and I, who knows if we would be <laughs> together, right? Um, so we did a lot. Of, we did so much creative stuff during that time because you know, what else were you going to do? He is somebody that I met him in, I want to say 2005 around winter. Uh, we did like a table read for uh, – it was supposed to be – it was a short film done by a student who was in her senior year. It was getting ready to graduate and we auditioned. Everybody, you know, there were a bunch of people that auditioned and we both got roles for it. It was like a samurai gangster flick mm -hmm. and uh, it was called Brotherhood. And I don't think that an edit has ever come together that has seen the light of day. <laughs> but it was a very particularly niche, like neo-noir style kind of like samurai gangster flick. And I mean, we're and we're talking like we're out there with live swords, like swiping at each other. And only I think I want to say two of us had martial arts experience to be doing this. And so the other there was a good period of time where we were like teaching people how to use these things. And so we, uh, the fight choreographer had to kind of like go through and, and tailor the fights to each person's skill level. And the lead for it was not a martial artist at all, but he had like the most sword fights of everybody in the squad. And uh, I, I can say he was, I was really impressed with how far he came along. And um, that by the time our script or our, our fight scene was being choreographed, we knew what room we were going to be in and we were able to get on location. It's actually where Big Springs is mm. before the, uh, before they went through and renovated all of that, the one main large room had a huge hole in the ceiling and it was like kind of falling in <laughs> at any point in time that could have, we had a, a business table set up like right in the middle of underneath where this hole is where like realistically any of that could have just started to fall on us. But uh, I have all of the video files to that. And now that I've come much further along in my audio and video it. production journey, get it out there. I thought about it. What's really funny is if I did it and I had it set up in a way where it could be like the 20 year anniversary of the movie that never got released. Uh, man, it was like such a great experience. And, and one of the things that I one of the people I met out of that cast was Jason, who was kind of like the leader of the group. He was like our Leonardo if we were a group of Ninja Turtles plus two. <laughs> and uh I, he was in a band called Audio Imagery, yeah. and so I don't know if you listened to that whole podcast, but basically we d jumped down that avenue, and 
man, he was just, he's always been somebody that's super creative and very, uh, very charismatic. And I've always just enjoyed kind of like working with him and, and talking to him. And we haven't really gotten to connect with each other until we did the podcast uh, in years, but we've been around the same area and oh, we yeah. just bumped into each other. And I was like, Hey, I should have you on the podcast. And he was like, yeah, I'll come in. And then, uh, and then we just recently started doing, he brought me in because this app realm mm-hmm. AI, um, they are sort of like a, it's like Instagram for AI generated yeah, art. We're going to be doing an improv show with them on this. Yeah. Friday. So I will be there for that. Cause oh. uh, after having the podcast with Jason, Jason was like, Hey, uh, this guy needs video work to help promote this app. And so I've got some ideas, um, can I hire you to do it? What would your rate be? Like, what can we do? If I can get a price that he can sign off on, I'm going to have you come in and do this. And so I did an event form at Three Dots earlier Great. this week. And uh, actually, the same day we were doing the podcast, I set mm-hmm. up at your podcast, came back to the studio, I was working on a client edit, and then I left and went down to Three Dots. And then at like nine, I left there to come home, drop off all that gear, and then or come and back come. here, drop off gear, and then go down to the studio to get ready for the podcast. Um, the Ransom Raves podcast. Which, by the way, was like so much fun. Like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, thank for you, sure. Thank you for, for that. Uh, you know, Dana and Jess. So Dana's on, uh, mo- was on Modern Family and in Bridesmaids and everything, and I've known her for a while. They were so impressed with the whole community, our theater, uh, how professional you were, how quickly it came together, you know. Uh, well, you so. ended XL Fest with this live yeah. uh, to tape. Yeah, we wanted to do something. Of, we, wanted, yeah. we wanted to do something different. Uh, so we did the live filming of the Rancor Ray yeah. podcast, and that's how you rounded out the entire yeah. XL Fest. And they they were super sweet. They were like, I think like it, from a perspective of like uh, being able to bring other creatives into the area, it's really good to kind of leave like a lasting good final mm-hmm. impression. And I was definitely. Um, excited to kind of be a part of being able to help that happen. I mean, when you came to me and you were like, this is what I want to do. Like, can you walk me through how to, I was like, by the time I'm going to sit here and explain to you how to hobcobble this together, I can just tell you, you just that I'll do, do it. it. <laughs> you go about your way. I will set up and do this damn thing on that night. And then we will be, it will have taken significantly less, less time than oh, all yeah. the time it would have taken you to run around and get shit and cables and adapters and oh. this, that, and the other thing, just to hobcobble something together. I was like, and this is a better Oh, setup. Ab- absolutely. It's like when people are like, hey, I want to run this improv session, like all this other stuff. And I'm like, by the time you research it and I tell you what to do, like, just bring me in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. do an hour with your people. I won't charge you. Like, let's just, it's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and you can find, some, to me, there's always like that. The barter system is strong mm-hmm. in this world right now. Absolutely. If, you, if you've got a skill set that you can contribute, there's something to be said for an exchanging of services, mm-hmm. not just, you know, exchanging a monetary goods yeah and that what's what we we do that now every time every time someone reaches out you know if they want to do a if they want to do an improv workshop there's a there's going to be a quote that i'm going to give them and if they come back with like well that's not our budget then it's gonna be okay well what is your budget and then what else is there are there a couple of five star reviews on facebook and on Google that are going to come come with this? Can I get, can wink, I, wink, nudge, wink, nudge, wink. if you're catching can my drift. I, can I get some, you know, what else, uh, you know, can you give me the names and email addresses of five people who would want a similar thing? Like where where can on the business side I still Just find this. value? Yeah, yeah. Uh, because I also want to make sure that I'm not, like was at the very beginning, when we started Happy Valley Improv in 2016, 2017, you know, a lot of times people would ask us to do things. They'd say, we don't have a budget, we would just do it. Right. And I'm like, well, now we're like, we need to start valuing until we start valuing what we do. Like no right. one else is, is going to, and you know, and you know this in this town. There's so many nonprofits, and the nonprofits are they're trained. The executive directors are trained to be like, well, we're a nonprofit. And I'm like, yeah, well, Penn State's a nonprofit too. Like, yeah, please, yeah. You know, we, I, I, I see what you're board. saying here. <laughs> I'm on the board of multiple nonprofits. I know the finances that are behind it. Yeah, if you, you get salaries money, if you're on a nonprofit, you have money to give to professional development. Right. Um, we'll help out with that. That's fine. But you know, if the you know, if the board of the arts festival wants to do an improv retreat, then that's fine. You're going to pay for it. Like, right. and that's okay because that also will show a comment, like show that we're collaborating, which means our people will probably attend more arts fest things. It'll probably donate more to your center gives. It's probably a wash at the end. Um, but yeah, so we've been, we've come a long ways in the business side. So I'm not the worst. I guess I was the worst business owner. Now I'm just, yeah, you're a developed good. business owner now. I'm developed. You're putting it together now. So, yeah. uh, so I mean that kind of actually, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that, like the comedy and, uh, social activism side of things. Like do you, do you believe that comedy can be like a powerful tool for addressing social issues and affecting that change? Yeah, I think it can be a powerful tool. Um, I, I, I think that, 
I, I think comedy can be, uh, I don't know if I would say like, oh, it should be like, but like, if that's what you want to go towards, like, great. I also wouldn't blame anybody at all who was like, I don't want that in my comedy. I well, want to, I want to escape, which is fine. The people that I, you know, I don't like people who complain about that type of thing, right? Like, oh, keep the politics out of sports. And it's like, okay, like you can have that opinion, like whatever, but certainly like, <laughs> you don't blast it off and like make a big deal out of it. Like just don't watch or something. You got to understand that your opinion only goes <laughs> so far. Exactly. That's your opinion. That's your and opinion. now you can put it out there by all means, yeah. but you can't necessarily assume that that's going to affect change. Right. I think like for me, uh, it's, it's more that the, the other side of the conversation is people might think that it risks diluting like important messages by channeling through like, uh, you know, the, by trivializing serious issues through the lens of comedy. But I mean, I think, you know, and I think we kind of talked about this, like all great comedy is really born out of tragedy. Yeah. So like, there's something to be said for, you know, uh, obviously time and punctuality, like how long after nine 11 was a nine 11 joke made. Right. I feel like that felt like a really long yeah, window it's before. A long time. And now uh, it's funny that like, you know, as we celebrate like 10 and 20 years later, I'm like, damn, I hear that joke being made a lot. I hear jokes about that being made a lot. And I remember it being like a thing that was almost, it felt like untouched for like the first decade. Yeah. And you know, it's, when it comes to when it comes to some social commentary, I think it also still ends up coming from you as a comedian, you as an individual. What is your experience, and are you are you talking about things through your own life and your own lens? That's what we try and talk about in our in our classes. Right, right. So it's way different when Pete Davidson does a 9-11 joke because his father passed away. Right. Father, <laughs> I right? think he almost it's gets way, the exclusive exactly. pass to be able to do it because he was directly you know, affected by you know, it. You know, it's way different. If I were to try and make some sort of joke about, you know, being f like, oh, th my wife was followed home in a dark alley and like making jokes about something because I'm I'm bringing light. Maybe I'm maybe I'm trying to do it super. I'm like, I want to be intelligent. I want to kind of bring light to stalking and all this other stuff. But once I start talking about someone else's experience or lived experience, it just ends up not being as genuine. And so the audience then starts thinking like, well, where is this going versus right. if it's your own experience? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, so like I think I think, you know, when I watch, you know, you, you might watch. Uh, different comedians from different backgrounds, if they're really talking about their own upbringing and you're like, oh, I can see where this is coming from. Uh, I think it becomes difficult when you uh, – and, and that's why like you might say, oh, well, I saw this XYZ person talk about it. Why can't I? And I get that question all the time in class. I say it's not that you can't. It's just that I promise you I've been around long enough that the audience, especially at the Blue Brick Theater in, in State College – the 60 people here are not going to take well to that joke. I'm just like, if you don't say it, like, right, right, you, right. You as a white male, if you start calling people bitches, it's not going to go well here. Oh yeah. Actually. So <laughs> it's funny like, you say that because one of the jokes that one of the comedians made in the writing class that I went yeah. to after the class, it, it was kind of saying that he was treating it in that regard. And it was like, it was, it's palpable how much it almost hurts to hear it come out of his mouth. Cause you're right. like, I'm getting secondhand regret from you right now saying yeah. this. Cause I know it's not tracking or going over as well as you think it is. Yeah. And it's not like, it's also, I mean, there's so many different variables that come into play about whether or not something's going to go over well. And I think your uh, tone and attitude and all of that kind of like definitely fits into the, into play there. I, I think that there's comedic boundaries exist in different contexts. Like mm -hmm. there are things that are appropriate for a comedy club that are not going to translate as well to a corporate event or a television show. And you have to be kind of mindful of those things. And I think that ultimately that's you, your, your job is kind of difficult in that regard, because I feel like you're in charge of helping them discover the context of influence on what comedians can and cannot joke about in those spaces. Yeah. Because it, it does take, like it's reading a room, honestly. And, and it's difficult with television and cameras because you, you don't know what the room is or who's right. tuning in, but you know, you can definitely tell in a corporate event or you oh. can definitely tell in a comedy club setting. Or even just different comedy clubs in different cities. Like we, you know, I've done, I've done shows all around center region and you know, certain jokes that I say, I'll tweak them depending on if I'm in Tyrone or Kerwinsville versus like downtown state college or Altoona. Like it just, it's going to, it's going to depend on your audience. What I, what I like that we've created, I think, I hope and believe at the Blue Brick Theater through the class and the writer's room is I want to give the, I want to give the, the safe space for people to 
find where that line is for them. Yeah. And like, because we've had people go up there and you've, like you said, you've experienced it. We're like, oh, like you get that cringe and like you feel the bad. Ick, dude, the, the ick, ick. the <laughs> ick, right? Um, and I try my best to be as like, unless it's extreme, which is very rarely happened, but just be like, hey, instead of calling Alexa and Siri those bitches, why don't you just say those women or those chicks or something? Right, right, right. Like, what if we can change the language to just bring more people in? Like, we, I just had class last night. And one individual, he was telling some sort of joke of he drives a Prius and there was a guy in a truck and looked down. He's like, he must have been thinking, what's this fat guy doing in a, in a Prius? The guy is not what I would consider an obese individual. You know, he's not fit and he's like 50 something, but he's not what I would say is, you know, huge. Right. So we just had a conversation of like, as an audience member, if anybody who, like, if you call yourself fat, which has, you know, obviously a negative like connotation, connotation of, to of it of plenty. Anybody who has a body type that is bigger than yours in the audience now thinks that you must think they're grotesque right. because you're not this, you know, you're not Ralphie May, like, you, you know, you're not 400 pounds or whatever. Right. So how can we change that to just bring in a few more people in the audience to be on your side? Like, that's my goal is to like get people to find their funny and find their creativity that can bring as many people into their circle as possible. I think that's better for comedy in general. Yeah. I mean, I also think that there's something to be said for this aspect of, uh, we are real. We really love the like flaunt the first amendment out there Yeah, as if like freedom of speech means you're free <laughs> from consequences. Correct. Yeah. And yeah. ultimately I feel like there's this exercise in like, I understand I, I'm definitely against the concept of censorship <laughs> and, I think you have to kind of combat it at, on all fronts. And unfortunately, that means people have to have a voice that I would prefer didn't. Right. But that's the point of freedom of speech. But what we get away from is this idea that we're not somehow going to hold people accountable for right. yeah. their free speech consequentially in the back end of it. And there's something really important about even if you weren't doing comedy, just in the context of self, the concept of comedy and self-censorship, even without the comedy involved, is super, super important because – you need to have this, like you said, context and intent matters, right? So like you have to have the ability to censor yourself in certain situations and read a room. Okay. And if people feel like you almost need unanimously, you can tell like the person who is like, oh, I don't give a fuck if these people want to hear this thing I'm going to say, yeah. I'm going to fucking say it. And I hope they're uncomfortable. It's like, then you clearly don't care about like the, the room. And honestly, this is the, these are the people that you're, you are catering to. Like there's to some degree, you got to be who you are, but to the other degree, you have to find a way to relate to these people. And the yeah. more abject ways you put in between you and them to be able to distance themselves <laughs> from you and not absorb what it is you're trying to put out there, you can build up to a really uncomfortable joke at the end of like a five or 10 minute set that will hit really, really well if you can kind of find a way to net it's you're threading a needle. Yeah. And like every bit you do along the way and your setups and, and punchlines along the way are what get you there. And so there's also something to be said for winning an audience over. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes it comes through the act of self-censorship. Yeah, and that's a thing, that's a skill in life that people need to learn anyway. Yeah, it's not just comedy. I mean, I've been to concerts where like, you know, maybe people maybe it's not as big as I I vividly, vividly remember this in undergrad. We had dashboard, and we I went to a super small undergrad, but it was private. They had a bunch of money, so they brought in dashboard confessional to like do our end of the year. He used to come through <clears throat> and say at the KOA campground that my yeah. friend owned. That's like right out of town here, and so uh, Chris Carava, I got yep, to, I got Chris. to see him play a bunch yep. of songs before this. He came out on the Spider Man soundtrack, mm -hmm. like right before they blew up uh, when the OG Toby Maguire Spider Man yeah. was popping off. Uh, he was coming through, and I, I saw him play like acoustically be a campfire yeah. and like he was super nice to us as a student org and then he got on stage and there was only i don't know five thousand people in this like auditorium uh and you know started making comments about oh last night i was here with fifteen thousand, and now of course i'm here and like just making comments and you could just feel like you lost the the audience right i yeah man, it's a, you, comics already always do this and i don't know why but like you can't, they're like, oh, you know, my career's really taken off. Now I'm doing stand up at the Blue Brick Theater in State College. And like, then there'll be like some kind of laughs. But like, you know, if the audience, if, if now I feel like I'm the piece of shit for not <laughs> being in a bigger venue with you correct. because you did, I didn't book this, you piece of shit. Right. Like, <laughs> like, you've, like, it's, and, and it's a, uh, and, and to be honest, it is, it is 
definitely a it's a protective thing, you know, it's, I feel I'm, I don't, I'm, I don't, I want to be vulnerable. I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little worried. So I'm going to say this and like, Oh, kind of build myself up. And it ends up being a cheap joke because like, it's usually early in the set and the yeah. audience is still like, Oh yeah, I guess it is kind of funny. Like if you're doing this, um, you know, you've I'm had doing, some pretty big names come so, through actually. I've saw, we, we've like, had some, we've had some great, some great folks, uh, come through with, you know, through, through wisecrackers or through setting my own stuff up. We have, um, I'm really excited in July. I have a buddy who is in New York and he's been working his butt off in both comedy and theater. And he went to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival last year. He brought his show here first to test it out. And now he's going back with two more shows. They're both like one man written type, um, not stand up sets, but comedic sets. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's going to put those up at the theater again, which will be super fun in July. Uh, yeah. So we just. We're just trying to keep growing it, man. There's a place in uh, Lidditz, Pennsylvania, outside of Lancaster, that's like an amphitheater set up for a lot of larger musicians to go through and do like their tour rehearsals yeah. before they go out and they, you know, take their show outward. And they're not playing in them in front of crowds, but there is really something to be said for having like these smaller scale opportunities to kind of. We actually, when we uh, when we went to Indonesia, I booked us a couple extra shows for earlier in the week so that we could just okay now that we've had a day or two to get over jet lag and uh, check all of our gear and make okay. sure things are good to go. We had things we had to do on the stops along the way. We had a lot of press to do while we we're out there. But the, the most important thing to me was I want to get a feel for the culture of people here actually. And it's really hard to do that in a, in a room of 10,000 when you're like, I don't know any of these people. And I, you can just go out there and put on your show and do whatever. But it was really nice to be able to say, we went and played some smaller, like 50 cap, 100 cap shows. Yeah. And I had like really great conversation. We got to kind of see how we were going to be playing live. It was like our, like we'd had plenty of time to rehearse, but by being able to set ourselves up to work through any sort of like we were, uh, they, the venue, the promoter set us up with the studio that let us go and actually like uh, rehearse. So we could have like one rehearsal while we were out there. And then like two days later, we, on like a Friday, we had a show that was just sort of like a small intimate. It was actually a, a Kopi Bung Prend. It was a coffee shop. And in the back, there's like a pool with like an acrylic walkway that you could walk <laughs> out on top of. And like that was like a singer's walkway and there was oh, space wow. for the band in the back. But um, because we didn't uh, sell enough tickets or maybe they, it was like too hot at that time of year to be open outside, oh. they didn't have us perform outside. And so we did this like upstairs little smaller rock area and the venue packed out. It was so much fun. And we got this opportunity to kind of test our legs before we went and headlined the next yeah. night and uh, at the ice arena. And it was, dude, I mean, I, I like that you're able to do that. I think that that is important. I think it's actually, that's also a scalable business model, right? Oh, like, absolutely. hey, um, you know, instead of paying some place that you're going to go pay to rent to get in and rehearse, otherwise, could you come and use this place as a place to like live practice and get through yeah. it that way? And yeah, we do, you know, we, we just do a ticket split and yeah, we perfect. have a, we have a good deal with the Hyatt right across the street for like comedian rates nice. for like super cheap hotel rates. So you know, I, you know, I just tell, I've told a lot of people, we've had a lot of those shows lately, you know, maybe it's up and coming comics who are trying to build up to a headliner and they're doing their own little tour. They're you right. know, stopping at breweries, stopping at that. And I'm like, Hey, you come on through. We'll just, whatever you want to sell tickets for, I'll promote it. I'll pay for the staff and we'll just split the tickets. Uh, what do you, what are like the, what's the high and low of uh, guarantees you've seen for like, without naming them, obviously. Oh. Like, like what's the lowest end guarantee? Door deals are obviously that's your that's your bottom tier. It's like your door deal. How oh, that well? Yeah, yeah. Is um, you know it, it. You know if you're talking like high end people like Tina Fey, right? If you're looking at like you totally know, different scenario, fifty thousand, hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand. No, um, you know we, I talked with my. I have a really good friend. His name is Jay Black. He's one of the funniest people I've ever met. He, um. He writes movies. He's toured as a comic. He's the first person I ever opened for. He's the reason why I got into stand-up comedy, to be to be honest. Uh, he's come through with Wisecrackers, and we're connected on all the socials. And so we chatted um, in March. I was like, hey, I'd love to have you to come back out. He's like, I'd love to come back out too. Like, I don't want to go through uh, the Wisecrackers because they don't do anything till the, till the, to the winter. And he's like, here, I have a new agent. Like, go ahead and, and talk to him, and I'm sure you'll you'll figure something out. Uh, and you know, the agent was, was like, Hey, uh, you know, I know Jay likes you. I know that this will be a good, uh, this will be a, a decent fit. Uh, you know, as long as you can, as long as you can guarantee, uh, that, you know, we can, we can get a thousand bucks for the weekend, like 
we'll we'll figure something out. And I was like, oh, that's not too bad. Like I can put out three or four shows and like, you know, try and try and sell things out. Um, I'm sure he's probably getting that for a show, not four shows, uh, but because right, we right. because we know it. Uh, I know. Well, that's that, the thing too, yeah. right? Like State College functions uh, in the music realm. I'm sh- I don't know if the comedy world has this, but I feel like it, I can't imagine they don't. But the radius clause of like you can't play within 90 miles or 120 mm-hmm. miles of an area within 90 days or whatever yeah. so that you don't kill the ticket sales for what could be this other place yep. by playing somewhere like right down the road from it like a month earlier. Yep. And so uh, one of the things that State College kind of functions really well for is that we're almost out of every radius clause right. between uh, – not necessarily maybe Harrisburg, but certainly Pittsburgh and Philadelphia right. and Cleveland and so in New York. So like any of these people that are like they have an off day, usually if they have a long enough drive to get from point A to point B, they can kind of add like an an A.5 and stop right. in at State College and play the show. And it's a gimme. And uh, usually if they're smart about it, they book it outside of their booking agent so that they don't have to pay that percentage on that. So they're willing to take like a slightly less amount anyway right. or even a substantially less amount. I, I, I get these offers all the time. And it's a great way to sort of like build the community here, give them an extra stop off. I mean, State College for all intents and purposes is like a C or a D market, right. but it isn't like a dead fish. Like you, there are people here that will enjoy to see the right shows that would sell out and do like, you know, Irving Plaza in New York or, you know, uh, House of Blues in Cleveland. They're probably going to have a harder time selling that number of tickets here in State College just because of the volume of people that are here. Right. But if you add it, on to your, you know, your, your itinerary and it's listed and you're promoting yeah. it, it's a good opportunity for them to make decent money, hit another avenue, make some more money that they otherwise weren't going to make. And we're just going to have an off day. And it gives them the ability to sort of build into an area where you can almost assume that if it's a big enough artist, people will travel from the other surrounding areas right. to come in and see it. If they've got, you know, that, that core fan base, that's really yeah. there for them. I mean, they just announced a second date for whose line. Uh, yeah, I at saw the that state theater and, you know, tickets for that are $77 after fees, like for a two hour short form improv comedy show. Right. Um, which is great for us at the Blue Brick Theater because just more improv and more comedy in town gets people saying, oh, that was really fun. I wonder if there's anything else like that local. Are you guys interacting um, with that at all or? No, I am. Um, I it's mean, almost a shame they wouldn't say, hey, they helped with ticket sales. Like, why don't we have the Happy Valley Improv Group go in and do a ticket split with them to get some of these yeah, tickets sold? Yeah. Um, I've, if they added the second night, one of them sold out, right? So right, if one the of them one, is not going to sell out because of the first night's ticket sales going right, out. So perhaps the Monday night one, there might be something. I mean, I've been in talks with them. You know, I talked with them about, um, you know, are they going to be doing programs and do they need like a sponsor or anything like that? Because that would be, you know, you'd be getting in front of the right people. Right. Certainly. Uh, a little bit of guerrilla marketing. We had our All folks, about it. All we, about it. So we, you know, they have an ad uh, that says like State College, we're coming to you. And there's yeah, 500 it. comments. It's popped up. Uh, so we had all the folks in our company go on and make comments and tag our own company, Happy Valley Improv, Blue Brick Theater, you know, very positive. Oh, this is so awesome that we're right. going to have more comedy, you know, just like there is every Friday night at seven at this, right? And then <laughs> right, we right, all right. liked each other. So those moved to the top. Yep. Uh, so we are interacting in that way, like trying to find, find fun ways. Um, and I'll sometimes- probably do, I'll probably up the, uh, the week- Around that, I'll probably put a few extra dollars in the local geo social medias. Um, uh, you know, just try to do little little things um, with it. Well, so this is this kind of touches on something else that I think is really important. I think regardless of what creative avenue you're kind of going down, whether it's comedy or a singer songwriter or, or, or improv or whatever, there is something to be said for adopting basically whatever strategy almost works for you. And being able to be creative in that aspect as well, because there are a lot of ways that, I mean, to me, immediately from like the idea perspective, whenever I hear that, I'm like, why wouldn't they give you guys like 15 minutes to open or something like that for the night that is going to, that they could choose which night is not selling as well to do the ticket push and then just do a ticket split for for that those tickets that are otherwise not going to sell if you guys sell some and you're willing to they give they're willing to give you 50% of the tickets that you guys sell right. with a specialized code it is worth it to them to have that room be packed out and filled out right. those people are still paying the same price the venue is just making less money off of it but they're making more than they would have off of tickets that right. weren't sold and i don't know how it is in music i know in comedy you know a lot of especially for stand up a lot of people will bring their own bring their own opener. Um, right. And so they won't, I, I have no idea how this who's lives type show even 
even goes, I was shocked that they sold out. I just felt, I, I mean, I, I really grew up on Who's Line and really like it. Uh, and, you know, they have Ryan Stiles coming in and Greg Prop, So, like, they have a good cast coming in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was like, I don't think I would pay seventy five dollars to go. Right, uh, but the people that, that are value it, yeah. that are twenty years older than us that were also watching Correct. his line yeah. said, anyway. Like they, they, they have the space to be able to do that. They're coming into town. I mean, it's great. I mean, I want more people to come into downtown State College. I want I want the, that money coming here. And of course, it's the it's the state theater, which is great because you know we want to keep different different things. So I, I'm I'm glad. I I was you know debating on reaching out to their folks and just saying like, Hey, you know, there's going to be an improv show happening like right after yours. Like, you know, I'm sure there's the radius clause and they can't, we can't promote that, but it's like in the city where afterwards people, a lot of times, you know, Seinfeld or rock or whoever will have a show right? and they'll stop at a club later on and do five, 10 minutes of new material. I mean, at the very least that. there are people that are coming out here in state college to see improv. So as a baseline, it's worth it to have, you know, one or two ambassadors with yep. like, a, not, I mean, flyers kind of get a bad rap, right? But like, there is a way to kind of like promote at the, in the you know, almost like picketing in the front free of the venue. Ticket, free tickets. Yeah, People free, free, free tickets, tickets or half off or whatever. Like just kind of, it's an outreach, right? It's public yeah. outreach. And so you want to have this ability to kind of showcase, hey, we're here. We're actually right around the corner. Yep. And, we, you know, we are also doing this. If you like improv and you want to yeah, kind of, come I mean, this is your audience. This yeah. is your core audience. And so even though it is sort of a guerrilla marketing tactic, right. like I'm not against, uh, and I get clever with it too. Like uh, we for some of the shows that we did, some of our better ticket selling shows in the area, I'll create a poster, an event flyer that's basically a rehash of whatever the tour poster is that we're opening for, yeah. region, you know, locally. And then I have a QR code for where people can click to buy tickets on it immediately. And then I go to local businesses and I'm yeah. like, hey, I know which ones are like my go-tos and have are heavily trafficked and allow us to do it. Some of the tattoo shops and piercing places all about it because it's a part of the culture, you know, music and piercing. Hey, we hung tattoos. up we hung up your flyer for the one at stage. One. So I mean, to me, that's like a an easy way that. Uh, I think people sometimes rest on their laurels of like, oh, well, I just don't know. Like, uh, I don't know yeah. if they would let us do that. It's like to some – I my first year on Warped Tour, we won a battle of the bands from Ernie Ball. And we didn't know until the week before our date that we had applied for. It was in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And so for like two or three months, we're promoting you know, our music and our channel and trying to get votes from all of our fans and like trying to release stuff and put stuff out there to get that attention. And we don't find out. We played a battle of the bands that we lost to like a local – favorite that was from that area that was able to sell way more tickets. And we were driving like two and a half hours to Scranton to sell tickets. And, uh, so we didn't win we were kind of bombed and, uh, and I kind of had the flu that week. I literally threw up before I went on stage to play. And then the next week on like Sunday, we get an email saying like, Hey, you guys have been selected. You guys won your regional date of warp tour. And so we used our wristbands that we got to get into the tour they change color like I think every day or whatever, but it's local venue security that's checking them. So all they see is a wristband. They're like, oh, they're the band. OK, blah, blah, blah. So we followed the tour up and down the East Coast for two weeks, selling our, our CDs in the lines and uh, going into the venues and watching all the bands that we were like mm -hmm. super stoked to just like be there and see. And uh, and we had a really great set that day. But. I think it's up to the individual creative person to actually be willing to kind of pull out all the stops and be willing to take some risks and try some things to get your name out there. And I could easily see that being an opportunity to, you know, <laughs> a sandwich board over somebody and, yeah. you know, having them go out there and just, just start doing it, just doing or, improv on the, like right outside. We should just, we'll just sit up and start doing improv outside as people are coming out and like, what's this going on? Just we'll all wear our merch. Yeah. And I love it, man. Like, I, I think that that's, there's, there are all kinds of creative ways that you can use to promote whatever your art is. And, yeah. and if you're not willing to kind of address some of them and at least tackle them, it's like you're shooting yourself in the foot. And oh, yeah. so it's good to see that you guys adopt that kind of guerrilla mentality oh, when it yeah. comes to doing it. You know, we always have our, we try and put our sign out. We're trying to, you know, we're trying to. To get people to come through the theater. Well, well figure it out. I'm really, really impressed with what you've done so far. Uh, I'm definitely going to take the comedy class. I don't know when I'm going to take it. I would love to take it in the fall because I would love to be able to perform in front of a fall crowd. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think it's absolutely vital what you're doing in this area to I'm promote trying. this culture. Yeah, I mean, I, I know I mean, it's not just me. I've got a team. You know, we got two other, two other founders and our company is now over 20 people that volunteer there time and energy and tell their friends to come. Uh, I just am the one that 
is way more outgoing, so I'm the one that comes on the podcast. Somebody has to be the face <laughs> of it, right? <laughs> somebody, somebody has to be the uh, the one who will do the shameless plug at a random Rotary meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. How's everybody's decaf coffee? All right, well, I got a few things I'd like to say to you. Uh, yeah. Well, dude, I mean, keep doing what you're doing. I think that, you know, it usually takes a couple of years to kind of build anything yep. like that in this area, and you guys are off to a ridiculously strong start. And I'm really glad that you guys are in the area because it's given me the opportunity to kind of like cathartically express through comedy yeah. and even just be able to go and see it. It's It's fun to see. Even if somebody's terrible, it's fun to see that. Like, it's yeah. great to be – it's just great to go and be like, this is here. It exists here. Mm-hmm. And – you know, good and bad comedy exist everywhere. We are not excluded from experiencing that anywhere, especially here. So I'm glad that you have like these outlets for improv and I'm excited to hear that you guys are going to be doing skits. Yeah. Uh, I think that means we're about to have to have that conversation about the media upgrades. We got to apply for certain grants <laughs> for to get you grants. set up. More. Yeah, we would, we would love to, to have more media stuff, but you know, it's as an improv theater, that's good. If we want to start doing other things, we'll have to do some upgrades and we'll, we'll see what happens. Well, I'm very, very glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're doing it. Where can people uh, find things and information about Blue yeah. Brick Theater? And- so bluebricktheater.com, uh, happyvalleyimprov.com, all the socials, search for that stuff. It'll be there, uh, except for the Twitter. We're kind of off the Twitter now, uh, <laughs> as most people are. I've, it's I've mostly seen. bots. So. It's uh, most, mostly bots. Um, but yeah, mainly Instagram, Facebook, bluebricktheater.com for those who are listening local can go and get a free ticket by signing up for our mailing list and coming out Friday nights at 7 p.m. James Tierney, thank you for coming on, man. I appreciate you being here and sharing all this with me. Uh, it's it's no great problem. to talk to you. I knew this was going to be a great episode. <laughs> Glad to have you here. Uh, we'll definitely have to have you back on next time you guys have some uh, yes. a big event coming up. Hopefully hopefully, I'm the 21st one, so that way I can uh, make sure that I'm I'm past your stats. You didn't talk about the stats on this one, which you did on the other two I listened to. The stats of what? <laughs> of most podcasts only make it to 20, and you have to just get 20. Yes, <laughs> and so actually just this week, just as this is like a fun little pundit uh, note, is that I have actually scheduled my 20th podcast, so now I have to get together and schedule the 21st podcast. Nice. Uh, Jason, definitely, I want to have him on it. Um, and so I actually, I had my guest Sam Gilman on. He's a, a drummer in a band called First to Eleven. Nice. And he mentioned like, yeah, maybe you should do like a, a panel of like there your you favorite guests up to that point and, and have them come on. So we're actually talking about having, uh, so I have Jason, I definitely want to have on Sam. I want to have on, and then I got to look through the roster of who I've had right now to see when I can schedule that and who's available to be that third, you know, other person will turn this table and it'll be more of like a sports center, sports center style setup or whatever. But yeah, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Of course. I appreciate it. I'm going to make it to the top 0.5% or whatever it is. You're going to make it. It's a video game, man. If you give me that number, I can get to that number. I just got to know what the number is. And the next time you see Jason O and I, we're going to be writing some more comedy songs. Yeah. So, well, he's got all summer free because Angel's exactly. in the world. We're going to get, we're gonna get an stuff. album. We're going to put an album out. Yeah, you absolutely should. <laughs> and he's got the infrastructure in place to make sure that that oh, yeah. definitely happens. So it's just a matter of you guys. Say, that's... We did not dive into that, but that is definitely something that I want. I'd love to have the both of you on for like the twenty second we'll episode. Do. That's we what we'll, we'll do. We'll bring all. We'll we'll bring his voice, his good looks, uh, and his guitar, and the songs that we wrote together. And I'll just let him perform, and I'll sit back. Listen, man, Saturday Night Live <laughs> is conducted by a team of writers, right? Exactly. So, like, if you yeah. have if you have a strong writing team behind That's somebody who is very talented, like Jason, and making like comedic jokes in yeah. the context of songwriting you've got a pretty unstoppable formula yeah. right there that you could, you, that's a nice traveling circus right there <laughs> i would go and see that sorry i just extended your podcast by no not minutes. at all dude hey again james tierney thank you so much for coming here Thanks, blue brick theater make sure you guys check it out uh that's gonna be a wrap for this episode sounds good Boom. we're always collaborating at all times with the universe that is a wrap on another episode of the Collaborate Eye podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed making this episode for you. And now it's time for our favorite part of the show, the part where I beg you to please hit that like button, subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you never miss an episode. And don't be shy. Give us a shout out on social media at Collaborate Eye podcast on all the cool platforms to share your thoughts, your feedback, and your love. Until next time, Collaborate Eye, baby. <laughs>